This is Audible. University Press Audiobooks presents Food Politics: How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health, written by Marian Nessel. Part Four: Deregulating Dietary Supplements. We now turn to a new topic: How a relatively minor segment of the food industry, the makers and sellers of dietary supplements, convinced the public and Congress that its products did not need to be regulated according to the strict standards applied to conventional foods or to drugs. Supplement makers do not need to demonstrate that their products are safe and effective before selling them. What is left of supplement regulation is based on the assumption that supplements are safe until proved otherwise, and Congress places the burden and responsibility on the beleaguered Food and Drug Administration (FDA) to do such proving. The industry also achieved a regulatory system that holds claims for the efficacy of supplements, their ability to perform as advertised on the label, to a remarkably low standard. The industry-driven deregulation of supplements would not concern us so much if its consequences were less profound. Most supplements, after all, do appear safe. Their cost is low compared to that of medications, and most people who take supplements can afford to buy them. What is of concern is how little we know about the thousands of products available. Research on supplements other than vitamins and minerals is in its infancy. And few products have been tested adequately for safety or health benefits. While investigations are in progress, the supplement industry jumps the data, makes extravagant claims for the ability of its products to prevent or treat disease, demands less and less federal control over its practices, and goes to court to enforce those demands. The makers of conventional foods, watching sales of supplements increase at a greater rate than they themselves can achieve, also are demanding and getting the same kinds of loose regulations for foods. It is difficult to believe that this situation is in the best interest of public health. Although the supplement industry has always couched its political efforts in terms of health benefits or freedom to choose, its more immediate rationale was and is economic. Supplement makers do not want to have to conduct lengthy, expensive clinical trials to prove that their products are safe or useful. They would like blanket permission to market supplements as promoting whatever health benefits seem convenient. Given a choice between following rules that apply to foods. And following rules that apply to drugs, they prefer the more favorable. They like regulations that assume supplements are safe. They want to be able to make the kinds of health claims permitted for prescription drugs, without having to conduct clinical trials to prove that supplements actually meet those claims. Before the mid 1990s, however, the laws required the FDA to make supplements follow the rules either for foods or for drugs, as we shall see. In pressing Congress to exempt supplements from either set of rules, the industry undermined the FDA's regulatory authority over foods and drugs, as well as over supplements, to the great detriment of the public. In the context of this discussion, supplements are products taken in addition to food, and for some health purpose, in the form of pills or potions. They include the common nutritional supplements. Vitamins, minerals, and other essential nutrients, as well as herbs and diet supplements. Although more than 15,000 such products are sold in the United States, the supplement industry makes up only a small fraction of the food industry as a whole. It accounts for no more than three percent of total U.S. food sales. The use of supplements is growing rapidly, however, and at least half of the adult population takes one or more on a regular basis. In the belief that the products will improve health, well-being, strength, or endurance, will compensate for poor dietary habits, or will prevent or treat one or another kind of illness, because so many people take supplements, and because people who take supplements tend to be better educated and better off economically than non-takers, they constitute a powerful political force in support of the industry. In these chapters, we will see how supplement makers used this force in their own self-interest. It seems reasonable to expect that everyone would be concerned about whether supplements are safe, whether they do what they claim to do, 
and whether the benefit of taking them outweighs any financial or health risks they might induce. When it comes to supplements, however, the world is divided into two broad and sometimes overlapping categories. People who believe that supplements are useless unless demonstrated to be effective through standard methods of scientific proof, science-based, and those who believe that supplements are beneficial whether or not their benefits can be scientifically proved, belief-based for want of a better term. We shall see in these chapters how the supplement industry exploited this dichotomy to escape testing requirements and to gain the ability to suggest claims for benefits, whether or not such claims could be substantiated according to accepted standards of scientific proof. Today, marketers of supplements are permitted to make practically any claim they want for the health benefits of their products. They may vary the ingredient contents of their products with impunity. They do not have to remove potentially harmful products from the market unless taken to court by the FDA, and they do not have to prove that their products bestow the benefits claimed for them. This remarkable situation is the result of the industry's persistence and skill in generating public pressure on Congress to restrict the FDA's regulatory mission. These chapters explain how such a small segment of the food industry was able to achieve this political coup. Chapter 10 lays the groundwork by explaining how federal food and drug regulations applied to dietary supplements and how the food industry as a whole worked to undermine regulations that restricted the ability of companies to claim health benefits for their products. Chapter 11 describes how Congress came to require the FDA to approve health claims for conventional foods and supplements and then increasingly passed laws relaxing restrictions on those claims. Chapter 12 discusses the implications of supplement deregulation for the food industry and for public health. Chapter 10. Science versus Supplements. A Gulf of Mutual Incomprehension. Early in 1999, I took a European visitor, newly appointed as director of his country's equivalent to our Food and Drug Administration, FDA, on a field trip to my local health food store. I thought that he might be interested in the vast array of dietary supplements and the benefits claimed for them, as indeed he was. His home agency demanded proof that supplements were safe and effective before permitting them to be sold as health remedies. And his country, like others in Europe, does not permit misleading health claims on product labels or in advertisements. Like most health food stores, the ones in my neighborhood offer thousands of products. Many of them are the familiar nutritional supplements, vitamins and minerals, that have been studied for years and produce effects on health that are well documented by research published in respected scientific journals. But most of the products are herbs, botanicals, food extracts, enzymes, and diet or fitness formulas that have barely been investigated, if at all. Some may have been used as traditional remedies for millennia, but almost none has been studied with anything like the scientific precision needed to define active ingredients, biological effects, safe levels of intake, or the ability to alleviate symptoms of illness. Despite the paucity of research, health food stores routinely shelve supplements as remedies for specific conditions. Allergies, bone health, colds, toxins, fatigue, heart health, immune function, women's health, or just the generic feel-good. Even a casual glance explains why the products might trouble a government official responsible for food safety and consumer protection. Their names alone... Blood Builders, Brute Strength, Coles Aid, Estra Prime, Herbal Laxative, Joint Fuel, Liver Support, NeuroMind, OsteoCal, Prostacare, RX Memory, Sound Asleep, Stress Formula, Imply Function. The label of a product that we picked at random from the Immune Support Shelf stated that it contained black elderberry extract, Echinacea, zinc, propolis, and vitamin C. The brochure for the product explained that these ingredients are all well-documented for their health-promoting benefits, 
a statement guaranteed to raise questions in the mind of even a moderately skeptical health official. Of course, the nutrients in this product, zinc and vitamin C, should promote immune function. All essential vitamins and minerals are required for a healthy immune system, and these two have received more attention than most. But what about black elderberry, echinacea, and propolis? To help answer this question, the store conveniently provides a desk copy of Prescription for Nutritional Healing, a book that matches hundreds of supplements with the conditions they are supposed to alleviate. The book describes echinacea as anti-inflammatory and antiviral, but provides no citations to research studies that might support that role. A somewhat better researched work, the physician's desk reference for herbal medicines, explains that black elder is a folk medicine used for coughs, colds, and fevers, but warns that proof of efficacy is not available. On balance, the ingredients in this particular immune supplement seemed unlikely to be harmful, but beyond the sources of information available in the store, there is no way to know whether the product truly contains the ingredients listed on its label, whether the ingredients are active or safe, or whether the product performs as advertised. No government agency has approved or evaluated the contents, let alone determined that they will work. As explained in the brochure that accompanied the product, the claim for health benefit has not been evaluated by the FDA, and the product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. In contrast to the protection afforded European consumers, Americans get little or no help from government in evaluating dietary supplements. The present anarchy in the dietary supplement marketplace is the result of decades of political action by the makers of these products, culminating in the industry's crowning achievement, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, an act invariably referred to as DSHEA, pronounced DSHEA. As we shall see, DSHEA gave the industry everything it wanted and then some. It deregulated dietary supplements and undermined the FDA's regulatory authority over supplements and conventional foods as well. After Deche, the FDA could no longer take the kind of responsibility for ensuring the accuracy of information on product labels that consumers had come to expect. Deche, in turn, must be understood as an attempt by Congress to balance two sets of competing priorities. On the one hand, the rights of consumers to buy products perceived as harmless, whether or not they actually do good, and, on the other hand, the responsibilities of federal regulatory agencies and the concerns of scientists and consumer advocates about the physical and economic harm that supplements might cause. This balancing act has a long and complicated history involving multiple agencies and organizations. Running through this history is a conflict between two modes of judgment about supplements and about more general health issues, one based on personal belief systems and one based on scientific belief systems. Between these viewpoints lies the great gulf of mutual incomprehension that the writer and scientist C.P. Snow described decades ago in his classic lecture on Two Cultures. For consumers, the result is confusion, misinformation, and lack of protection against health claims that at best are unwarranted and at worst are false. The Two-Culture Problem In deregulating dietary supplements, Congress effectively shifted safety responsibility from industry to the government. The government, therefore, effectively shifted this responsibility to the public. In demanding only semantic restrictions on what marketers can claim about health benefits, Congress weakened not only the FDA's ability to protect the public from supplements that are in fact hazardous, but also its ability to control the inappropriate marketing of food, food additives, and even drugs. This achievement was hailed as a tremendous victory by the supplement industry. As one of its lobbyists gloated, Deche stands for the unusual precedent that the FDA was wrong. 
This is one of the first times where an agency got not just publicly slapped on the wrist, but in a congressional setting, they lost power. The agency lost big for the first time. To explain how this victory was accomplished, this chapter and the next review the contentious history of dietary supplement deregulation. As we shall see, the driving force in these events was, and continues to be, pressure from the dietary supplement industry to promote its marketing interests. The events, however, also reflect the expression of two conflicting views of the role of science in public policy. In theory, the FDA's policies are supposed to be science-based, which means that the agency requires products to be proved safe and effective according to commonly accepted, mainstream, standards of scientific evidence. In contrast, the industry takes what I call a belief-based approach to dietary supplements. Supplement makers argue that adults have the right to decide for themselves, on the basis of their own personal beliefs and experience, whether a product is worth taking and is effective. People who hold belief-based attitudes tend to view supplements as natural products that, one, promote health, Two, correct dietary deficiencies due, for example, to poor eating habits, depletion of nutrients from soil, pollution, stress, or aging. And three, are far less likely than FDA-approved drugs to be harmful. In contrast, people who adopt science-based approaches tend to believe that most dietary supplements are of questionable content and safety, and that any health benefits claimed are largely unproven. For the most part, the rationale for both sets of views is demonstrably factual. It is only the interpretation that differs. From a scientific perspective, the preponderance of available evidence suggests that if they were tested, the great majority of supplements now on the market would prove to be no more effective than placebos, and that a few would be demonstrably harmful. Science-based regulators would prefer to see the results of research studies demonstrating a supplement's safety and effectiveness before approving it for marketing. The conflict between science-based and belief-based views of dietary supplements perfectly illustrates the gulf of mutual incomprehension that C.P. Snow saw to lie between scientists and non-scientists. I first experienced this gulf when teaching nutrition to medical students who might be expected to hold science-based approaches to dietary supplements. I described a clinical trial that had demonstrated beyond question that improvements in symptoms of the common cold reported by participants had been due to placebo effects, not to the vitamin C tablets they mistakenly thought they were taking. After the lecture, the students surrounded me seeking advice about how much vitamin C they should take or recommend to patients. Even people trained in science take supplements and believe they are useful, either for nutritional insurance or for other belief-based reasons used by non-scientists, reasons connected only marginally to convincing scientific evidence of benefit. As this chapter illustrates, the FDA's attempts to impose science-based regulatory standards on an industry with wide appeal to a public that subscribes to belief-based views of dietary supplements caused the agency no end of woe. Astonishing amounts of work, followed by increasing isolation from the public, from the courts, and eventually from Congress, which voted for personal beliefs over science when it passed Deshaies. FDA versus Nutritional Supplements Although most supplements on today's market are herbals and botanicals, the ability of manufacturers to make claims for their health benefits derives from application of the FDA's science-based view of nutritional supplements, vitamins and minerals. The FDA's position on nutritional supplements dates from the early years of the 20th century. As soon as vitamins were discovered and their nutritional functions identified, manufacturers began using them in supplements and advertising them as a necessary means to overcome weaknesses in the food supply or daily diet. Right from the start, the prime targets of supplement marketing were middle-class women, the group least likely to have nutrient deficiencies 
except perhaps iron deficiency anemia, but most likely to be concerned about family health. This strategy helped the industry to grow rapidly. By 1935, vitamins accounted for as much as one-fourth of the total sales of leading drug companies and one-third of sales in the average drug store. Retail vitamin sales rose from $32.2 million in 1935 to $82.7 million in 1939, during the Great Depression. Although concerned about such trends, the FDA could do little about the labeling or advertising of questionable products until Congress, in 1938, passed amendments that eliminated the need for the FDA to prove claims fraudulent. In the 1950s, the regulatory cycles became increasingly contentious when the FDA took a much more aggressive and confrontational stance against the makers of nutritional supplements. In 1954, a year in which an estimated half billion dollars was spent on nutritional quackery, the FDA proposed to establish standards of identity, precise formulas used for ingredients in foods such as ketchup and ice cream that would enable the agency to regulate supplements as an entity rather than case by case. This proposal resulted from concerns about the unrealistic claims made for nutritional supplements and fears of toxicity from high doses of certain vitamins. Thus, the FDA proposed to require all vitamins and mineral supplements to contain a defined set of nutrients at defined levels, otherwise the products would be considered drugs. This proposal constituted only the first of the many steps needed in the unbelievably tedious process of issuing food or supplement regulations. Like other federal agencies, the FDA is required to open all proposed rules for public comment and to consider all comments in developing its final regulations. Typically, the FDA announces proposed rules, calls for comments, considers the comments, proposes revised rules, opens the revisions to comments, considers these comments, proposes final rules for comment, and only after considering these further comments, issues final rules. At best, this process takes years and involves a succession of interminably lengthy notices, in very fine print, in the Federal Register. In this early case, industry and other groups argued that the FDA's proposed standards of identity were totally unnecessary for vitamin and mineral supplements of such evident safety and physiological function. A Citizens' Advisory Committee agreed and urged the FDA to increase its educational efforts rather than engaging in litigation against potential quackery and to put greater effort into helping the industry deal with the FDA's scientific concerns. The standards of identity threat encouraged supplement makers to join together to form an association, the National Health Federation, NHF, which soon began lobbying congressional representatives and informing consumers about the need to protect their freedom to choose supplements. In 1961 and 1962, the FDA and the American Medical Association, AMA, held joint national conferences on quackery, that suggested to the industry that the FDA was colluding with mainstream medicine to require a doctor's prescription for anyone who wanted to take a vitamin or mineral supplement. Despite warnings of the near-hysterical level of industry concern about its proposals, the FDA continued to pursue science-based standards. Because research did not show much benefit from nutritional supplements in healthy people, the agency not only continued to advocate the unpopular standards of identity, but also proposed that supplement labels include a disclaimer. Deficiency symptoms have been induced only under experimental conditions, and there is no convincing evidence that the ordinary diet requires supplementation with these nutrients. As might be expected, this proposal elicited an outpouring of industry opposition. The National Health Federation generated 40,000 of 54,000 letters sent to the FDA on this issue. Nevertheless, the FDA persisted in maintaining a strict science-based approach. In 1966, it again proposed standards of identity, 
this time specifying an even more restrictive disclaimer to be displayed in prominent type. Vitamins and minerals are supplied in abundant amounts by the foods we eat. The Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council recommends that dietary needs be satisfied by foods. Except for persons with special medical needs, there is no scientific basis for recommending routine use of dietary supplements. Again led by the National Health Federation, supplement companies and their supporters deluged Congress with more than two million letters, more mail than was later generated by Watergate, protesting the proposed rules and demanding that Congress intervene. A lobbying organization of the pharmaceutical industry joined by 12 drug companies producing vitamin supplements took the FDA to court on a technicality. The group argued that the FDA could not implement its proposals because it had never held hearings on this issue. Even critics concerned about FDA's failure to serve as an effective counterweight against the corporate greed and irresponsibility of the $125 billion food industry complained bitterly about the agency's narrow interpretation of the scientific evidence related to nutritional supplements. During the next few years, the FDA held the required hearings. These were said to have generated 32,000 pages of testimony and more than 20,000 letters arguing against every possible aspect of the proposals. One of the FDA's most controversial proposals was to classify as a drug any supplement of vitamin D or vitamin A, which can induce toxic symptoms in adults at doses 5 to 15 times higher than recommended levels, if its dose just slightly exceeded those levels. This proposal alone elicited 2,500 comments and 1,000 signatures on petitions, nearly all of them unfavorable. Holding fast to the view that supplements are nutritionally irrational, the FDA eventually published final regulations in 1973. These specified the upper and lower limits of supplement potency and retained the classification of vitamin A and D as drugs, but dropped the requirement for the unpopular disclaimer noted above. The industry sued. In response, the courts intervened, struck down the standards of identity, and prohibited the FDA from classifying high-potency supplements as drugs for reasons such as lack of nutritional need or toxicity, reasons that the court considered irrelevant. Congress intervenes. The Proxmire Amendment, 1976. At about this time, during the early 1970s, under pressure from the industry and the public, Congress introduced several bills to prevent the FDA from regulating the dosages of nutritional supplements. In 1976, these attempts succeeded when Congress passed an amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the Proxmire Amendment, as a rider to a health bill that was certain to pass. The Proxmire Amendment firmly disallowed standards of identity, and it said that the FDA absolutely must not set limits on the amounts of vitamins and minerals in supplements, classify supplements as drugs, demand that supplements contain only useful ingredients, or bar supplements from including useless ingredients. From the standpoint of supplement marketers, Proxmire meant the survival of our industry, Without that, the FDA could have crippled us. To science-oriented commentators who believed that supplements should be proved useful before their manufacturers were permitted to make health claims for them, the Proxmire Amendment was the first retrogressive step in federal legislation since 1906, or, as expressed by the then FDA commissioner, a charlatan's dream. Subsequent court actions further diminished the FDA's authority to apply drug laws to supplements. Then, in 1979, after 25 years of futile effort to regulate the supplement industry as a whole, the agency gave up, withdrew its proposals, and returned to enforcement on a case-by-case basis. Later that year, the FDA made one last attempt to classify nutritional supplements as over-the-counter drugs. It recruited a panel of nutrition scientists, 
to produce a monograph on vitamin and mineral supplements and used the monograph in a way that could not have been better designed to provoke opposition. It defined vitamin and mineral supplements as drugs that would be labeled for use in the prevention or treatment of a deficiency when the need for such therapy has been determined by a physician. This meant, for example, that the label of a supplement of vitamin C, ascorbic acid, a vitamin safe except at extraordinarily high doses, would have to say, for use in the prevention of vitamin C deficiency when the need for such therapy has been determined by a physician, and would need to include this warning. Patients with gout and or a tendency to form kidney stones may be at increased risk when taking more than the recommended dose. Diabetics taking more than 500 mg vitamin C daily may obtain false readings in their urinary glucose test. And as though that were not enough, if the vitamin C occurred in the form of sodium ascorbit and contained more than 125 mg of sodium per dose, the label must add, Do not take this product if you are on a sodium-restricted diet except under the advice and supervision of a physician. With this level of overkill, it is not difficult to understand how industry groups could convince Congress to intervene by introducing a bill to prohibit the FDA from defining nutritional supplements as drugs. Although the bill did not pass, the FDA wisely withdrew the controversial monograph. At that point, manufacturers could market vitamins or minerals in any dose, but if labels claimed that the pills mitigated, treated, cured, or prevented diseases or symptoms, the FDA would consider the products to be drugs and insist that they be regulated as such. Breaching the Health Claims Barrier Kellogg's Allbrand, 1984 The initial break in the FDA policy came as a result of an unexpected maneuver from a surprising source, the Kellogg Cereal Company. Kellogg had created a new marketing campaign for its line of Allbrand cereals. The cereal boxes said, the National Cancer Institute believes eating the right foods may reduce your risk of cancer. Here are their recommendations. Eat high-fiber foods. A growing body of evidence says high-fiber foods are important to good health. That's why a healthy diet includes high-fiber foods like bran cereals. Kellogg had developed this text by working closely with the National Cancer Institute, NCI, a sister agency to the FDA within its parent agency, the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS. According to reports at the time, the Institute's scientific staff and legal advisors had reviewed the material to check the accuracy of the statements and to make sure that they did not imply that the NCI endorsed the product. From the standpoint of the NCI and political appointees in DHHS, the Kellogg campaign would infuse millions of dollars of private sector funds into the promotion of cancer prevention messages. Kellogg's alliance with the NCI largely excluded the FDA and caught the agency by surprise. According to an FDA staff member who was present at meetings at the time, FDA was never consulted, nor did Kellogg ever suggest to NCI that there might be any FDA concern about the matter. Incredible as it may be, it never occurred to NCI that there were any regulatory implications of putting what they considered to be a perfectly reasonable public health education message on cereal boxes. FDA staff realized immediately that the Kellogg campaign seriously threatened the agency's regulatory authority over label statements. They understood that if the campaign was not stopped, health claims might become commonplace and beyond the reach of the agency. A reporter quoted Dr. Sanford Miller, then the head of FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, as expressing skepticism about the scientific basis of the Kellogg statements. This ad is incorrect, because there's no evidence that this kind of fiber can help. It's a scientific issue. How far can you simplify the agency simply hasn't figured out a way it can protect its very powerful tool in regulating claims on food and at the same time allow claims to go on.
The FDA's attempt to block the Kellogg campaign failed, however. It was overruled at higher levels within DHHS, not least because the FDA position was inconsistent with the deregulatory ideology of the administration of President Ronald Reagan. Political appointees in DHHS and the FDA did everything but outright endorse the Kellogg advertisements. As the commissioner of the FDA explained to the National Food Processors Association, the profit motive alone does not account for your serious consideration of innovative approaches to food labeling. I think we'd both agree that an informed public can make better decisions about the products that it buys and consumes. FDA's job is to encourage this trend by cooperating with industry to make healthful products available. The FTC also enthusiastically endorsed the Kellogg advertisements and recommended that other companies follow suit. According to the FTC's Director of Consumer Protection, Kellogg's claims appear to be exactly the kind of adequately substantiated and responsible vehicles for providing beneficial information to the public that we believe it is important for regulatory programs to encourage, not discourage. Kellogg, although conceding that the fundamental purpose of its campaign had been to sell all bran, asserted that its actions were a public service and that the company would be irresponsible if it sold health-promoting products and did not tell people about them. Researchers at the FTC confirmed that the campaign indeed had informed consumers about the value of fiber to health, and that it also had caused a shift from low-fiber to high-fiber cereals. When an FDA analysis revealed an astonishing 47% increase in the market share of all brand within the first six months of the campaign, the message to the food industry was clear. Health Claims Sold Products Health Claims Proliferate With so much opposition to restrictions on health claims coming from so many sources, federal agencies were unenthusiastic about pursuing misleading claims. When the FDA did take action against one small company that was marketing a putative cholesterol-lowering supplement that could not possibly do so, the courts ruled that it was unfair of the government to pick on that company rather than a larger corporation such as Kellogg or RJR Nabisco. Food companies took advantage of this period of free-for-all regulatory inaction to label or advertise more and more products with health claims based on the FTC's less stringent requirements for scientific substantiation. Appearances of nutrient content claims, such as those proclaiming that products were low in fat or cholesterol or high in fiber, increased from 25% of the food advertisements in women's magazines in 1975 to more than 50% of those advertisements in 1990. Claims were especially prevalent in advertisements for meat and high-fat products, apparently to counteract any idea that such foods might be unhealthful. Some consumer groups and their sympathizers in Congress wanted to end the regulatory impasse and force the FTC to use the FDA's more stringent substantiation standards, but their initiatives did not get very far. Food and supplement industries were lobbying for precisely the opposite goal, to compel the FDA to follow the more relaxed approach of the FTC. By 1989, 40% of all new food products and nearly $4 billion in food advertising contained a health message of one kind or another. With the federal government immobilized on this issue, states took over regulatory enforcement against companies making deceptive claims for juices that were mostly sugar and water, for vitamins advertised as giving energy, and for high-fat foods said to lower blood cholesterol levels. The state cases often were settled when companies stopped making the claims and paid court costs. Kellogg, however, retaliated by suing a Texas legal official for slander after he was quoted as characterizing some of the company's health claims as lies. This chaotic legal situation finally ended when Congress passed the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990, which, as discussed in the next chapter, forced the FDA to begin authorizing health claims for foods and supplements. 
Until Kellogg broke the health claims barrier, the FDA had managed to keep the labels of foods and supplements relatively free of statements implying that consuming them would prevent or treat disease. Even in the face of overwhelming political opposition, FDA staff maintained that the agency's role was to hold foods and supplements to the same level of scientific substantiation of benefit that it required for drugs. If supplement makers could not prove that their products enhanced immune function, for example, the labels should not be allowed to say that they could. To makers and takers of supplements and to their supporters in Congress and federal agencies, this science-based standard seemed unnecessary, as well as bad for business. The division between the two cultures became even more pronounced in the years just prior to the passage of Deshay, as discussed in the next chapter. Chapter 11 Making Health Claims Legal the Supplement Industry's War with the FDA No person making a first visit to a health food store today, perhaps bewildered by the vast array of supplements and the statements made about their purported purposes, could possibly imagine that as recently as 1990, claims about health benefits were strictly prohibited. Until then, if the labels suggested that supplements might be useful for preventing or treating a specific condition, the FDA considered them drugs and demanded evidence that they were beneficial as well as safe. To the supplement industry and to supplement users, the FDA's science-based regulation seemed inappropriate, if not downright obstructive. Makers and sellers of supplements banded together to oppose the FDA's policies, in doing so, they appealed to the huge proportion of American adults who take supplements. They based these appeals on the beliefs listed in Chapter 10, but also on the rights of adults to exercise freedom of choice in the marketplace. Their highly successful organizing of grassroots support induced Congress to pass the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, Deshaies which forced the FDA to permit a wide range of claims for which scientific support was limited, weak, or non-existent. This chapter explains how the supplement industry achieved this victory. The previous chapter described how Kellogg's all-brand campaign produced two results. It convinced the food industry and makers of dietary supplements that claims about health benefits could help sell products and it forced the FDA to begin writing regulations in the late 1980s that would for the first time permit such claims to be made. Because the FDA insisted that manufacturers submit scientific evidence to support their claims, the White House blocked the FDA from releasing its initial proposals. In 1990, in what appeared to be a policy reversal, the White House finally permitted the FDA to repropose its science-based rules for health claims on food and supplement labels. This time, the FDA proposed to approve only those health claims substantiated by the 1. Totality of 2. Published evidence from 3. Well-designed studies 4. Conducted in a manner consistent with standard methods about which 5. Significant scientific agreement must exist. Six, among qualified experts. The FDA identified six possible claims for relationships of dietary factors to disease risk that were least likely to run afoul of the significant scientific agreement standard. Each suggested a reduction in risk. High calcium and reduced risk of osteoporosis low salt and high blood pressure, low fat and heart disease, low fat and cancer, high fiber and heart disease, and high fiber and cancer. Even though the FDA seemed willing to concede these six claims, its proposals elicited the usual furor. To the industry, the six distinct substantiation elements were too restrictive. The president of the Council for Responsible Nutrition, J.B. Cordaro, viewed the FDA proposal as the most retrogressive anti-consumer rule put out by the government in years, 
it will discourage companies from putting out information on health and from modifying their products to be more healthy. But Congressman Henry Waxman, Democrat California, said that the FDA should be doing more, not less, to regulate health claims. In today's market, the industry has an incentive to make exaggerated and inaccurate health claims on foods. I hope the FDA will finally begin prohibiting health claims unless the agency first finds they have a sound scientific basis. FDA enforces rules, evokes industry backlash. In the spring of 1992, the FDA Task Force Committee released its report on dietary supplement regulation. Noting that 30 years had elapsed since the FDA had first proposed rules for supplements, the committee recognized that the regulated industry believes that FDA has historically been biased against the use of dietary supplements. Although these beliefs are unfounded, the task force is aware that its recommendations will be closely scrutinized and has therefore conducted an objective and unbiased examination of all issues. Unbiased or not, the task force concluded that safety must be the primary regulatory consideration and that the industry should take responsibility for ensuring the safety of its products. Its report recommended that the FDA strictly enforce rules for supplements, establish purity and identity standards, and safe levels of intake for vitamins and minerals, regulate amino acid supplements as drugs, and regulate all other supplements as food additives, which meant that safety would have to be demonstrated for new products, just what the FDA had wanted all along. The FDA now had to deal with these recommendations as well as the public comments on the food labeling proposals before it could issue final rules for health claims. In the late summer of 1992, a front-page story in the New York Times told a shocking tale. Armed FDA agents in Washington State had stormed an alternative medicine clinic that treated patients with injected vitamins and minerals. The Times characterized the FDA as opposed to the idea that supplements can be effective whether or not they are backed by science. It reported protests to the FDA action, among them a press conference at which celebrities urged the public to start screaming at Congress and the White House not to let the FDA take our vitamins away, and editorials demanding that, if there is any plausible excuse for the Gestapo-like tactics, it had better be forthcoming and fast. Just one week later, however, the Times published a carefully worded retraction of many of the statements in its article. The article erred in saying that the proposed regulations would classify vitamins and minerals as drugs and would restrict or prevent the sale of most medicinal herbs. But the damage had been done. I am one of the millions of Americans outraged by the Food and Drug Administration's unwarranted efforts to keep me from purchasing the nutritional supplements I desire, wrote one Times reader. Another complained that the FDA is overreaching its authority to a frightening degree and extending into areas that consumers are far better able to deal with themselves individually. The FDA, wrote a third, is trying to gull the public into not fighting to have the proposed rules changed. At this point, nothing the FDA could do or say would dispel such fears, nor could it convince anyone that restricting supplement sales was forbidden under the provisions of the Proxmire Amendment. The Times story only confirmed public suspicions that the FDA planned to regulate supplements as drugs, and it gave the supplement industry just the incident it needed to exploit such concerns. Reportedly, more than a dozen groups formed to ask the White House and Congress to intervene on behalf of the industry. FDA issues rules, elicits backlash, the industry mobilizes. In June 1993, the FDA expanded its definition of supplements to include not just vitamins and minerals, but also herbals, botanicals, and other such products. It continued to say that its rules for conventional foods also applied to supplements. It firmly disagreed with industry that this policy 
would deny millions of Americans dietary information that they need to improve their health, and thereby cost the nation millions of dollars in health care expenditures that could have been avoided. In announcing the supplement labeling proposals, FDA Commissioner David Kessler told a reporter that the industry was pushing hard for deregulation of its products, but had not given assurances that the products are appropriately manufactured that what's on the label is actually in the bottle, that they bear adequate directions for use to ensure safety, or that basic safety data has been collected and reviewed. The Council for Responsible Nutrition immediately charged that the FDA's substantiation requirements were biased, unnecessarily restrictive, and would limit dissemination of scientific information. The Council demanded that the FDA create a new unit that would regulate these products separately, permit use of individual scientific articles as substantiation, rather than the totality of evidence evaluated by experts, and broaden the definition of nutritive value to include the role of supplements in protection against chronic as well as deficiency diseases. A lawyer for the supplement industry said that if the FDA proposals went into effect, its products would have to be taken off the market because health claims are the lifeblood of the industry. Letters from supplement users by the hundreds of thousands poured into Congress and the FDA in what appeared to be a large and spontaneous consumer movement, which it most certainly was not. Instead, the protests had been orchestrated by supplement trade organizations using scare tactics to give cover to lobbyists and lawmakers in Congress trying to free the industry of government controls. The Nutritional Health Alliance directed much of this campaign. The Alliance's Campaign 93, for example, advertised, Write to Congress today or kiss your vitamins goodbye. Can we stop the FDA this year? It's now or never. 1993, the year for nutritional freedom. The group took credit for the letters arriving on Capitol Hill and used them as evidence for the effectiveness of its efforts to educate consumers about threats to the continued availability of dietary supplements. And well, it might. Its campaign set a new standard in grassroots organizing. The Alliance sent displays about how to write to Congress to 1,500 General Nutrition Center stores, planned blackout days, during which stores shrouded supplements in black crepe and refused to sell them, mailed information packets to every member of Congress, provided retailers with personalized letters to sign and mail, printed 500,000 flyers to put in shopping bags, produced window banners, elicited letters from 50,000 mail-order customers, distributed videos to 400 television stations and audio tapes to 10,000 radio stations, and topped all this off by intensifying its aggressive direct lobbying campaign on Capitol Hill. As part of these efforts, the Alliance had recruited a team of lobbyists with ties to key lawmakers and raised at least $80,000 in election funds for Senator Hatch, who continued to propose legislation drafted by the supplement industry. The senator was reported to have close ties of his own to supplement companies in his home state of Utah, to hold a small financial interest, $50,000 or less, in one firm, to have employed three aides who later took jobs as supplement industry lobbyists, to have raised $250,000 for a supplement trade group, and to have said that Utah companies are dominant players in the supplement industry, and there's no senator alive who wouldn't want to do what he could for that industry. Other supplement industry groups also warned their members that the FDA wanted to limit access to the products. An industry group called the Health Freedom Task Force produced a television commercial featuring a well-known actor displayed as arrested and handcuffed, presumably by FDA enforcers, for possessing a bottle of vitamin C. Although the FDA termed those images absolutely false, its ongoing activities were not reassuring. The FDA had just conducted a survey of claims made for supplements sold in health food stores 
in which investigators asked leading and perhaps entrapping questions like these of store personnel. I am feeling kind of weak. Do you have anything to help fight infection or to help my immune system? Do you have anything that works on cancer? Of 129 such requests, 120 had elicited recommendations for specific products. The report of this investigation also listed many agency enforcement actions against supplements for which people had reported adverse reactions. From 1989 to 1992, the FDA had taken 290 actions against supplement makers, most of them just warning letters. Among the actions, 250 were for making unsubstantiated drug claims, and the others for reasons of safety or improper labeling, leading the FDA commissioner to conclude that the marketplace is awash with unsubstantiated claims. We are literally back at the turn of the century when snake oil salesmen made claims for their products that could not be substantiated. The Industry's Incredible War Over First Amendment Freedoms With the FDA position apparently locked in place, the supplement industry intensified its lobbying efforts. In October 1993, the FDA offered one compromise— it proposed to authorize a health claim that supplements of folic acid could reduce the risk of neural tube defects. The agency seemed unlikely to be setting a precedent favorable to the supplement industry, however, because its stringent substantiation requirements for claims were about to become law. The Dietary Supplement Act of 1992 had granted supplements a one-year exemption from labeling rules applied to foods, but this extension was due to expire on December 15, 1993. When Congress did not pass any of the introduced dietary supplement bills by the end of 1993, the rules for labeling of conventional foods automatically applied to supplements and the industry would have to follow those rules starting in June 1994. This meant that health claims for supplements, other than the two approved for calcium and folic acid, would have to be authorized in advance by the FDA and shown to meet each term of the substantiation criteria that applied to conventional foods. In December, board members of the Council for Responsible Nutrition met with FDA officials to underscore the need for a one-year extension of the effective date on labeling regulations and the necessity to revise the agency's proposed rules. The Council's president said its members believed that FDA sees the need to be responsive to our concerns and we will continue to work to get our member companies' views accepted. The Council informed its membership that it would continue to work with members of Congress to obtain legislation that fully addresses the concerns of the dietary supplement industry. Senator Hatch also continued to take the lead in developing legislation to block the FDA's restrictions on supplement health claims, which in his view had caused this incredible war over our First Amendment freedoms. At issue is the right of millions of Americans to products that have been used safely for millennia. On one side is a tenacious bureaucracy, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, which by most accounts has shown a 30-plus year animosity to dietary supplements. On the other side are 65 United States senators, 240 representatives, and a legion of citizen activists who are united behind the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which will protect their right to unrestricted access to dietary supplements and information about their positive health benefits. The senator viewed as frightening FDA's 1993 supplement labeling proposals. He said they meant that purchase of high-potency vitamins and minerals should be limited, Access to herbal products should be restricted, and amino acids should be available only by prescription. The senator surely knew better. The proposal suggested doing so only when the products were labeled with unauthorized health claims. But he said, if we let the FDA get away with this, 
Next time, it will be even easier for the agency to over-regulate another industry. You have to wonder what interests the FDA is protecting when it holds up the regulatory shield to block the public from receiving potentially life-saving information in the name of good science. Consumer groups, on the other hand, viewed the proposed supplement bills as placing an intolerable burden on the general public to ferret out reliable scientific information from unreliable marketing hype and worse. Interestingly, the food industry also opposed the early versions of the legislation on the grounds that supplements and foods should be permitted to compete on a level playing field without a double standard based on whether a nutrient is added to a processed food or sold as a dietary supplement. Supplement Industry Wins Deshay FDA Compromises These arguments continued into the next year, until Congress passed Deshay and the President signed it into law on October 25, 1994. Industry officials hailed the bill as a move forward for the 100 million consumers who rely on dietary supplements and the millions more who could benefit from these products. We were happy we were able to get the bill through Congress this year. We achieved most of our legislative goals. Deshay passed when the FDA agreed to a compromise. The agency would now permit structure function statements for supplements just like the ones the industry had proposed a decade earlier. Unauthorized claims that a product could prevent or treat a disease, however, would still cause products to be regulated as drugs. The New York Times called Deshay a retreat for the FDA and noted how few issues during that congressional session generated as much grassroots emotion largely because the supplement industry waged a well-financed scare campaign that had many health-minded Americans convinced, wrongly, that the Food and Drug Administration was about to ban these popular products. The compromise measure is probably the best that could be hoped for, given widespread congressional support for weaker industry-backed legislation. During the following year, Industry groups pressed for removal of the remaining restrictions on health claims as burdensome and a disincentive. They asked Congress to enact further legislation to compel the FDA to use the truthful and not misleading substantiation approach of the Federal Trade Commission, FTC. They also continued to find grounds for challenging the FDA in the courts. Congress Allows Health Claims for Foods, FDAMA 1997 Three years after approving Deshay, Congress passed another law that indirectly affected health claims for dietary supplements, the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, FDAMA. The main purpose of this legislation was to speed up FDA's approval processes for drugs and devices, but one provision addressed health claims for foods. It required the FDA to authorize nutrient content and health claims for conventional foods whenever such claims were substantiated by 1. an authoritative statement, 2. currently in effect, 3. published, 4. by a U.S. government scientific body or the National Academy of Sciences. Under FDAMA, the FDA had to deal with petitions for health claims within 120 days. If it missed the deadline, the claim would automatically be authorized. Thus, a July 1999 advertisement by General Mills that the FDA agrees that eating whole grain foods like Cheerios, Wheaties, and Total may reduce your risk of heart disease and some cancers is not precisely correct. All that is certain is that FDA chose not to deal with the claim within the allowed time period. Given congressional intent, the FDA had little choice but to apply the provisions of FDAMA to supplements as well as to foods. Thus, supplement makers requesting authorization of a health claim also would need to notify the FDA 120 days in advance, and include documents demonstrating that the claim met the substantiation criteria. They would then be free to use the claim 
unless the FDA within the 120-day period issued an interim final regulation prohibiting its use or filed a lawsuit. The FDA interpreted congressional intent to mean that it should continue to apply science-based standards to the definition of authoritative statements and should require manufacturers to document that claims reflected one, consensus, two, deliberative review of the scientific evidence, and three, significant scientific agreement. The industry's impressive court victory was a challenge to the FDA's Significant Scientific Agreement standard in the landmark case Pearson v. Shalala. In the words of the 1999 appeals court, dietary supplement marketers Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, presumably hoping to bolster sales by increasing the allure of their supplements' labels, asked the FDA to authorize four separate health claims. One, consumption of antioxidant vitamins may reduce the risk of certain kinds of cancers. Two, consumption of fiber may reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. Three, consumption of omega-3 fatty acids may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. Four, 0.8 milligrams of folic acid in a dietary supplement is more effective in reducing the risk of neural tube defects than a lower amount in foods of common form. Pearson and Shaw were supported by an organization of health professionals who use supplements in their practice, and by Citizens for Health, a group of proponents of supplements. Citizens for Health was represented in the case by the chairman of its board, Jim Turner, a lawyer with a decades-long career opposing FDA policies on supplement regulation. He was the author in 1970 of The Chemical Feast, Penguin Edition 1976, a report by Ralph Nader's group that was highly critical of those policies. On appeal, the court ruled that lack of support for significant scientific agreement was no reason to deny a health claim. Such a denial would be unconstitutional on First Amendment, freedom of speech, grounds. The phrase lacked definitional content. The court called the FDA's requirements for scientific substantiation almost frivolous and ruled that it simply will not do for a government agency to declare without explanation that a proposed course of private action is not approved. Furthermore, the court chided the FDA for its unsound and simplistic view of human nature or market behavior in arguing that health claims might mislead consumers. Such concerns, it ruled, could easily be handled through use of a disclaimer on the package label. This decision cleared the way for less restrictive rules on health claims for supplements and encouraged makers of conventional foods to insist that Pearson v. Shalala meant that they were entitled to precisely the same First Amendment rights. Also in 1999, a Utah court interpreted Deshay to mean unambiguously that dietary supplements are to be regulated as foods, not drugs, and that they can be sold even when they contain active ingredients identical to those in prescription drugs. In Pharmanex v. Shalala, the court ruled that the FDA had no right to restrict sales of cholestin, a milled red yeast rice supplement, even though it contained a chemical indistinguishable from lovastatin, the active ingredient in cholesterol-lowering prescription drugs. Although such cases and others in progress were sure to be interminably litigated, they suggested that the supplement industry had achieved an environment in which all policies for health claims, whether for conventional foods or dietary supplements, for labels or advertising, would be forced by Congress or the courts to converge toward the less scientifically demanding approach of the FTC. The Tenacious Bureaucracy Concedes By this time, the FDA had little choice but to compromise its science-based approach. In January 1999, the agency announced program priorities for the coming year, with supplement claims high on the agenda. 
The FDA held meetings to solicit public input on how supplement labels could make claims that were truthful and not misleading, and it produced a guide for the food and supplement industries to explain just what was meant by the term significant scientific agreement. This guide, based on a report to the FDA from its Food Advisory Committee, is remarkable for its length, 18 pages of single-spaced text, complexity, and impenetrability. In addressing inherent problems of nutrition research, that studies vary in methods and reliability, are confounded by behavioral and environmental factors, such as cigarette smoking, level of education and poverty, require judgment in interpretation, and hardly ever yield unambiguous results, the FDA then defined significant scientific agreement as an apparent tautology. Significant scientific agreement refers to the extent of agreement among qualified experts in the field. In the process of scientific discovery, significant scientific agreement occurs well after the stage of emerging science, where data and information permit an inference, but before the point of unanimous agreement within the relevant scientific community that the inference is valid. The standard is met when the validity of the relationship is not likely to be reversed by new and evolving science, although the exact nature of the relationship may need to be refined over time. The FDA seemed to be saying that it would consider the evidence for each product on a case-by-case -case basis and would give greatest weight to claims supported by federal advisory committees, such as that appointed to review the dietary guidelines. If so, the FDA would have difficulty dealing with health claims that were not covered by the dietary guidelines, such as those that had been litigated in Pearson v. Shalala. In September 1999, the FDA announced that it would begin complying with the decision in Pearson and was seeking information about scientific studies to substantiate claims, such as those linking supplements of antioxidant nutrients to reduced risk of cancer, or omega-3 fatty acids and reduced risk of coronary heart disease. In November, the agency denied health claims that had been filed by plaintiffs in Pearson v. Shalala and another linking saw palmetto, an herbal supplement, to reduced risk for benign prostate disease. It also denied a claim linking supplements of vitamins B6 and B12 to reduced risk of vascular disease. These denials caught the attention of Representative Peter DeFazio, Democrat, Oregon, who complained that the FDA may not with impunity deny or delay fulfillment of the First Amendment obligations defined in Pearson. A group of scientists who conduct research on heart disease weighed in to support a claim for omega-3 fatty acids, as did an association of makers of fish meal and oils, arguing that if the FDA wants to show that they respect the scientific community more than the political community, the agency should authorize this claim which they said was supported by rigorous clinical trials. Greater pressures on the FDA to authorize a wider range of health claims could only be expected. The FDA's ongoing struggles to maintain scientific integrity in the face of pressures from the industry, Congress, the courts, and presumably the public, are best illustrated by its dealings with requests for supplement health claims. In October 2000, the agency issued a letter announcing a new dimension in health claims, a qualified claim, in which supplement producers could link omega-3 fatty acids, the good fats from fish oils and some plants, to reduced risk of coronary heart disease. In a 36-page review of research on omega-3 fats and health, the FDA concluded that use of such supplements was safe and lawful, but that the weight of the evidence required the label to include this qualification. The scientific evidence about whether omega-3 fatty acids may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, CHD, is suggestive, but not conclusive. Studies in the general population have looked at diets containing fish, 
and it is not known whether diets or omega-3 fatty acids in fish may have a possible effect on a reduced risk of CHD. It is not known what effect omega-3 fatty acids may or may not have on risk of CHD in the general population. From a scientific standpoint, this statement is a balanced summary of the current state of knowledge. From a marketing standpoint, however, it is hard to imagine how it might fit on a supplement label, let alone whether anyone might read or understand it. Perhaps for this reason, toward the end of 2000, the FDA gave a million dollars to the Institute of Medicine to develop a scientific framework to help the agency evaluate the role of dietary supplements in health. Although the FDA's plan for 2001 also kept health claims for dietary supplements on its A-list for action, it seemed doubtful that the incredible war would soon end, not least because the courts were so sympathetic to suits related to Pearson v. Shalala. The Pearson legal team sought and won separate court actions forcing the FDA to permit claims that supplements of folic acid, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12 could reduce the risk of vascular disease, and that 0.8 milligrams of folic acid in a dietary supplement is more effective in reducing the risk of neural tube defects than a lower amount in common form. In this last case, Pearson 2, the judge announced that the philosophy underlying Pearson 1 is perfectly clear, that the First Amendment analysis applies in this case, and that if a health claim is not inherently misleading, the balance tilts in favor of disclaimers rather than suppression. The FDA has again refused to accept the reality and finality of that conclusion. With such enthusiastic encouragement, the Pearson plaintiffs could be expected to litigate any claim denied by the FDA, one after another. For the moment, the supplement industry had won just about all of the concessions it had so long been seeking. It had succeeded in removing the government from any meaningful control over its products. Now it would have to police irresponsible companies or risk repeal of Deshaies. Thus, the long-sought deregulation of dietary supplements had consequences, some expected, others less so. The next chapter examines some of these consequences and their risks and benefits to the public. Chapter 12 Deregulation and Its Consequences Following enactment of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, De Chez, the results of its lowest common denominator regulatory approach were apparent almost immediately. Most evident was the remarkable growth of the supplement industry. This, of course, had been the point of the industry's efforts in pushing for the legislation. As this chapter relates, however, De Chez led to additional consequences, some intentional and some unintentional. Food companies seeking similar increases in growth began to produce supplement-enhanced foods that could be marketed using health, nutrient content, and structure-function claims. Pharmaceutical companies began adding herbal and vitamin supplements to over-the-counter drugs. Furthermore, companies attempted to position both foods and drugs as supplements, expressly to take advantage of the more relaxed regulatory requirements for health claims on those products. The ability of the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to respond to this situation was severely compromised as it was flooded by requests for review or authorization of claims, was overwhelmed by legal requirements to respond quickly, and was heavily challenged by the lawsuits that inevitably resulted when it denied a petition. As health claims proliferated, Public concerns about the composition, safety, and efficacy of supplements increased, as did public confusion about diet and health. Finally, Deshaies further polarized the gulf between people who viewed supplements as useful, even without the proof of efficacy, and those who wanted supplements held to science-based standards. Stimulating an Explosion in Sales 
There seems little question that Deche achieved industry objectives. It helped stimulate investment in dietary supplements. In the first five years after its enactment, supplement sales in the United States grew from $4 billion to nearly $15 billion, with herbals alone earning $4 billion. Sales of dietary supplements, as pills and as added to foods, were expected to exceed $30 billion by the year 2005 and to reach $49 billion by 2010. Worldwide, the market for supplements was nearly $40 billion in 1997, with herbals accounting for nearly $17 billion of that amount. Herbal supplements were a particularly good investment. Their sales increased by 18 to 20 percent annually during the late 1990s, according to one source, and by 269 percent from 1996 to 1999, according to another. Such growth rates greatly exceed the 10 to 12 percent annual increase for nutritional supplements, and both exceed the 1 percent growth rate typical of conventional foods. Marketing Foods and Drugs as Supplements In addition to providing a bonanza for supplement makers, Deche also led to a blurring of the distinctions among foods, supplements, and drugs. As we shall see in Part 5, major food companies began to invest heavily in research and development of products designed just so that they could be marketed using health claims. Food companies viewed the entire category of nutritionally enhanced foods, inconsistently termed designer foods, functional foods, nutraceuticals, or as I like to call them, techno-foods, as an unparalleled opportunity to achieve growth rates for food products as impressive as those for supplements. The new food products included not only the familiar vitamin-enriched breakfast cereals, but also such innovations as tortilla chips supplemented with St. John's wort and calcium-supplemented chocolates. The only conceivable explanation for development of such products was to present them as dietary supplements so that they could be marketed using health claims. By the time Deche was enacted, health claims were well understood as an effective stimulant to sales. Food companies understood the decision in Pearson v. Shalala, discussed in the previous chapter, to mean that the same permissive rules about health claims that applied to supplements also should be applied to foods as well. If so, food companies could market a product as a dietary supplement and avoid difficult approval processes for new ingredients. They could use structure function claims, and they could list herbal and other non-nutrient constituents on product labels, even if the amounts of these ingredients were too small to have any noticeable health benefit. The labeling rules for supplements require the Supplement Facts label to list nutrients the same way they might appear on food labels. Other individual dietary ingredients, such as herbs or phytochemicals, must be listed by weight but mixtures of herbal substances may be listed by the weight of the total blend, not by the amounts of their separate ingredients. Even more, the label does not have to compare the amount of herbs that are present to doses known to be effective, a regulatory omission that is a great advantage when the quantities of active ingredients are infinitesimal. With such advantages, it is understandable why the grocery manufacturers of America threatened its own lawsuit to force the FDA to grant food companies the right to use health claims that had been won for dietary supplements in Pearson court decisions. Drug companies also were eager to enter the food-as-supplement market because they could sell foods with therapeutic benefits without having to go through lengthy and expensive drug approval processes. As I explain in the next chapter, a division of Johnson & Johnson developed a cholesterol-lowering margarine, Benicol, and planned to market it as a dietary supplement. When the FDA balked at this strategy, the company successfully petitioned to have Benicol approved as a food considered GRAS, generally recognized as safe. When drug companies began taking advantage of this new marketing niche, 
by adding vitamins to aspirin and other over-the-counter drugs, the FDA had to warn them not to do so until the agency had reviewed the regulatory status of such products. Other products also crossed the line between supplement and drugs. A product called cholestin, for example, contains an extract of milled rice fermented with red yeast. This food has been used in East Asia for more than 2,000 years as a colorant, flavor enhancer, and herbal remedy. In the United States, however, cholestin is sold as a capsule. In a study funded in part by its manufacturer, investigators found the product's active ingredients to include at least nine compounds that inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis in the body, thereby lowering the level of cholesterol in blood. Because one of these compounds is virtually identical to lovastatin, a prescription drug approved for cholesterol lowering since 1987, the FDA understandably viewed cholestin as a drug and moved to prevent further importation of red yeast rice. As noted in the previous chapter, the courts overruled this action in Pharmanex v. Shalala and allowed cholestin to be sold as a dietary supplement, although a federal court later overturned this decision. Researchers have confirmed that cholestin reduces blood cholesterol levels by about 10% but they note that it is formulated to contain higher levels of active ingredients than traditional red yeast rice. As a prescription drug, lovastatin has been studied extensively, but hardly any research has been done on the eight other cholesterol-lowering ingredients in cholestin. Marketed as a dietary supplement, cholestin may contain ingredients present in prescription drugs, and its manufacturer does not have to adhere to the quality, safety, or testing standards for such drugs. Consequently, it can be priced well below its prescription counterpart. Early in 2001, I bought 50 capsules of the Cholesterol Defense Red Yeast Formula for $10.69. At the recommended dose of four capsules per day, a month's supply would cost about $27.00 a considerable savings over the $120 to $350 that taking prescription lovastatin would cost. Whether cholestin offers any other advantages is uncertain, because makers of supplements are not required to reveal doses or side effects. Given this situation, it is understandable that drug companies might want to compete with such supplements by advertising their own products directly to the public and claiming benefits that federal agencies might otherwise consider false or misleading. In short, as a result of Deshay, both food and drug manufacturers now demand the same regulatory advantages as those granted to producers of supplements. Eliciting Concerns Over Safety and Efficacy in the absence of firm regulation, the proliferation of supplements and of the claims for them has heightened concerns about safety and efficacy and has subjected the products to increasing scrutiny. Most concerns focus on supplements other than vitamins and minerals, but even these common nutritional products have been subject to questions about whether they are needed or cause harm in excessive amounts. Vitamin and Mineral Supplements Supplement trade associations go to great lengths to defend the safety of vitamins and minerals over a wide range of doses, arguing that nutrients rarely produce adverse effects, except when consumed at exceedingly high levels. Taking single nutrients in moderately high doses may not be a good idea, however, because many different nutrients are involved in every aspect of human physiology, High doses of just one nutrient can create imbalances that adversely affect the absorption or metabolism of other nutrients. The potential for high doses of vitamins A and D to induce toxic symptoms, for example, has been a source of concern for decades and was a principal reason for the FDA's historical interest in controlling the doses of supplements. More recently, clinical trials of cancer prevention using supplements of beta-carotene, a precursor of vitamin A, 
found in many brightly colored fruits and vegetables, further illustrate the hazards of taking high doses of single nutrients. Because previous clinical trials revealed that cigarette smokers who ate diets rich in fruits and vegetables had lower rates of lung cancer, researchers thought that beta-carotene might be responsible for cancer protection. They compared the effects of a high-dose beta-carotene supplement against those of a placebo in men who smoked cigarettes. To their dismay, the men who took the supplements had more lung cancers than those who took placebos. Although the supplement industry argued that the results applied only to people who smoked cigarettes, most observers interpreted the trial results as confirming the potential hazards of consuming single nutrients in high doses. The results also were interpreted as demonstrating the health advantages of consuming foods, not supplements. In 1997, the New York Times columnist Jane Brody summarized these and other potential hazards of the excessive intake of vitamin and mineral supplements. Apparently, the idea that nutritional supplements might produce adverse effects was news. In a Time magazine interview, Ms. Brody said, My major hope was to awaken the public to the fact that vitamins and other supplements are not always innocent. Too many people are taking huge doses without much evidence that they will do any good and without considering the harm they might cause. Considering issues of need, safety, and efficacy, most nutritionists continue to prefer foods to supplements. The government's dietary guidelines issued in 2000 say, don't depend on supplements to meet your usual dietary needs, but they do suggest that certain groups of people, pregnant and other young women, older adults, and people on restricted diets, may need specific supplements for special purposes. When government and professional groups do advise that the general public use supplements, they tend to recommend a daily multivitamin, multimineral product that provides nutrients in amounts close to recommended intakes. For example, with the caveat that more is not better and that supplements are not magic bullets and won't fix lousy diets, the Center for Science in the Public Interest, CSPI, recommends an ordinary daily vitamin and mineral supplement that contains the protective nutrients most likely to be deficient in average diets. This advice seems quite reasonable, especially given that extra vitamins and minerals are so readily available from nutrient-enriched and fortified foods, as we shall see in the next chapter. Herbal Supplements But what about the value and safety of the 1,500 to 1,800 non-nutritional herbal, botanical, and other classes of supplements now available? Little is known of the chemical composition, active ingredients, or mechanism of action of most of these products, and only a very few have been subjected to controlled clinical testing. As interest in this field has grown, studies have begun to demonstrate, albeit modest, benefits for some traditional herbal remedies. Small improvements, for example, have been observed in studies of saw palmetto for prostate problems and taking feverfew for migraine headaches. In some cases, as might be expected, studies funded by companies that make the products tend to show benefits for the supplement whereas independent studies find no such benefits. Studies of ginkgo biloba for memory loss in the elderly are a prime example of such research inconsistencies. Although most scientists consider studies that suggest benefits of herbal supplements as preliminary and inconclusive, the products may well help people with conditions that cannot be treated successfully with conventional medicines, even if they do so simply through placebo or other self-healing effects. Such effects can be very powerful and are often neglected in conventional medical practice. Nearly all published studies on the health effects of herbal supplements recommend further research, but makers of herbal products have little incentive to test their products. Research is expensive, time-consuming, and not always conclusive, unless the product can be patented, which traditional herbs cannot, 
the companies are likely to have difficulty recovering the costs of clinical trials. In the absence of a solid body of research, however, it is not possible to apply the usual scientific criteria to decide whether a supplement really does improve health. As for the safety of herbal supplements, the industry maintains that problems are rare. Rare, however, is a comparative term. From 1993 to 1998, the FDA received 2,621 reports of serious problems related to taking supplements, including 101 deaths, numbers that can be viewed as reassuring or alarming, depending on one's point of view. One difficulty with interpreting safety data is that people assume that dietary supplements are benign and may not associate health problems with taking the products. On the other hand, medical journals and newspapers tend to give disproportionately dramatic coverage to isolated reports of harm caused by taking supplements. Furthermore, safety is especially difficult to assess in products of inconsistent composition. An evaluation by consumer reports of echinacea and ginkgo supplements, for example, identified considerable variation in the contents of different brands, as well as among different samples of the same brands. One testing laboratory reported that half of the glucosamine chondroitin, antiarthritis, products it sampled did not contain as much chondroitin as was listed on the label, perhaps because this substance costs four times as much as glucosamine. Although the combination of the two substances is advertised widely as beneficial, the joint health product only contains glucosamine. The testing laboratory also found supplements of saw palmetto, ginkgo biloba, and echinacea to contain less of those substances than listed on the product labels. So little is known about the interactions among herbal supplements and conventional drugs that anesthesiologists warn patients to stop taking supplements before undergoing surgery. Pharmacists at major drug chains have also begun asking customers about supplement practices and advising them about possible interactions that might be harmful. The uncertainties reinforce the opinion of some scientists that taking supplements is like playing a lottery and provide grounds for more extreme critics to argue that the supplement industry is surely the most dangerous and the least regulated in America today. Confusing the Public As I explained in the introduction, the cacophony of nutrition news and advertising has caused even further public confusion about diet and health, to the great advantage of food producers. To many people, messages about single nutrients seem so contradictory as to thoroughly obscure the basic principles of healthful food choices. Presumably, health claims are supposed to help resolve confusion by educating the consumer about the benefits of certain food products and, as a consequence, stimulating purchases of those products. People opposed to health claims suspect that commercial reasons predominate and that the messages not only lack significant educational value but also mislead the public into thinking that the products convey special health benefits when, in fact, they do not. Health Claims for Foods The 1984 Kellogg's campaign to promote eating cereals high in fiber as a way to reduce cancer risk demonstrated beyond question that health claims increase the market share of specific products, at least in the short term, and subsequent studies have confirmed this observation. Whether health claims improve public knowledge of diet and disease prevention is a more difficult question to answer because so many factors other than supplements also influence health. As noted earlier, people who take supplements typically eat better diets, and they also share other health-promoting characteristics and attitudes that affect responses to health messages. All of these factors must be considered and distinguished from any effects of the messages themselves. In addition, health claims occur in an environment of newspaper and magazine advertising and of peer and medical discussions of nutrition issues. These, too, affect opinions about health matters. Finally, as health and nutrition educators are only too well aware, 
improved knowledge does not necessarily lead to improved attitudes towards healthful eating or to behavioral changes to improve dietary intake. Researchers, therefore, have attempted to isolate the effects of health claims, as distinct from all other factors, on the nutrition knowledge, attitudes, and behavior of consumers. Early studies examined the responses to nutrient content claims that began appearing in product advertisements in women's magazines in the mid-1970s. These studies indicated that women who read the claims developed favorable impressions of the advertised products, whether or not they actually understood the information. The reason? They believed that if the nutrition information appeared in print, it had to be correct. Studies like this one convey the impression that nutrient content claims increase awareness of the nutritional benefits of products, but do not yield much in the way of improved knowledge or better food choices. Federal Trade Commission, FTC, economists, and FDA social scientists independently analyzed the effects on consumer behavior of the 1984 Kellogg's Fiber and Cancer Campaign. Their quite different interpretations of the results make an interesting case study, for their conclusions reflect the distinct policy approaches of the two agencies. Researchers from both agencies agreed that before the start of the campaign, high-fiber cereals were more likely to be eaten by people who were white, more highly educated, non-smokers, and users of vitamin supplements. They also agreed that sales of Kellogg cereals and other high-fiber products increased in the months following the campaign. Differing, however, were their interpretations of why the sales increased. Soon after the campaign, the FDA analysts cautiously observed that the sales increase was consistent with the successful educational impact of the Kellogg diet and health campaign. Consumers seemed to be making an apparently thoughtful discrimination between high- and low-fiber cereals. The clearest evidence of a successful consumer education campaign would be increased sales for high-fiber products that were not promoted. However, in the competitive marketplace, successful product promotions are quickly emulated, and consumer education effects are difficult to identify confidently. Later FDA reports viewed the effects of health claims on consumers as complex and not easily summarized, mainly because survey responses seemed to be specific to the product as well as to the claim. FDA researchers concluded that even prominent claims on labels conveyed only limited information and were ignored by the vast majority of consumers. Health claims, they concluded, led consumers to believe that the product was likely to have positive health effects that it did not have. The effect was to reduce the likelihood consumers would read the nutrition information on the back of the package. Such findings, they said, made it hard to conclude that the impact of health claims is to produce more accurate perceptions of products' health benefits. Further FDA studies reinforced doubts about the educational value of health claims compared to other sources of nutrition information. Health Claims for Supplements In 1996, the FTC conducted a test of consumer understanding of the nutrition information conveyed by health claims in food and supplement advertising. The agency was especially interested in finding out whether people understood qualified claims those that attempted to account for undesirable as well as desirable characteristics of the products. The design of this study was exceptionally complex. Respondents were shown multiple versions of similar claims, and the written report is densely written and not easy to interpret. FTC investigators, for example, evaluated the reactions of consumers to several types of advertising statements for a fictitious cheese that was high in calcium but also high in saturated fat. From some, but not all, statements, some people understood that the cheese was high in both desirable and undesirable nutrients, but many people did not. In general, the qualified health claims led respondents to seriously underestimate the level of undesirable ingredients in products. People also tended to interpret advertisements stating that a product was 
lower in an undesirable nutrient as meaning that it was low in that nutrient, which was not necessarily the case. In their own exploration of this point, researchers at the FDA asked groups of consumers to discuss their reactions to claims for several dietary supplements. The results of these focus group studies were especially revealing from the two-culture standpoint. Participants liked to see information about health benefits on labels, but they saw no meaningful distinction between structure-function claims and FDA-authorized health claims. Furthermore, most participants were cavalier about the idea of scientific certainty. They expressed less concern about the truth value of the health claim than about the likely efficacy of the product for them. They did not equate the two ideas. The claim might be scientifically valid, but the product might not work for them. Or the truth value of the claim might fail to meet some scientific standard, but the product might still work for them. Most participants thought it was self-evident that a supplement product would not work the same for everybody. The practical implication was that you needed to try the product for yourself to see if it would work for you. This try-it attitude derived from the implicit assumption of most of the survey participants that supplements are inherently safe. Taken together, such studies confirm that health claims sell products, make products appear healthful whether or not they are, and are understood by some people, those who are better educated, etc., but may confuse others. Since the advent of Deshay, surveys have demonstrated increasing public confusion about diet and health. Whether health claims for dietary supplements have added to the confusion remains to be determined, but it is difficult to imagine that they contribute in any meaningful way to public understanding of nutrition issues. Polarizing Two Cultures In the entire history of the influence of private enterprise on federal nutrition policy, the actions of the dietary supplement industry must surely rank among the most effective. Over the years, industry groups relentlessly and successfully opposed any attempt by federal agencies to restrict the contents, dosages, or claims of benefit that could be made for dietary supplements. Whenever the FDA attempted to impose regulations, it faced massive opposition. Invariably, the net result was a loss of the agency's credibility and erosion of its ability to regulate food and drugs, let alone supplements. As summarized by one commentator, time and again the FDA has proposed comprehensive regulations to monitor dietary supplements, and at each juncture the agency has been met by lobbying and grassroots efforts led by supplement manufacturers, health food stores, and food faddists, all of whom have convinced Congress to block the FDA's efforts. Even the comparatively minor regulations the FDA has issued face waves of hostility in the courts. Supplement marketers succeeded in opposing the FDA because they were able to take advantage of popular beliefs in the value of natural remedies and widespread distrust of modern science and medicine. They also successfully exploited the division of regulatory responsibility between the FDA and the FTC, agencies with quite different missions and philosophies. Finally, because most supplements are safe, they were able to convince Congress and the courts that little regulation is required. I put safe in quotation marks because 12% of all consumers who report using herbal supplements, nearly 12 million people, have reported experiencing adverse reactions. Many herbal remedies are known to produce allergic reactions, toxic reactions, mutagenic effects, and drug interactions. And because most such problems are unsuspected and underreported, our recognition of the harm that such supplements may cause surely reflects just the tip of the iceberg. The supplement industry's effectiveness can be explained in part by a political environment that has increasingly favored a government that is smaller, less intrusive, and less responsible for the welfare of individuals. Supplement deregulation may appear as just one more conflict between business interests and consumer protection,
but it is notable in the industry's use of the freedom of choice approach to oppose science-based standards. This approach, of course, also figures prominently in discussions pertaining to the use of more demonstrably hazardous products, such as cigarettes and firearms. Dietary supplements are a good example of C.P. Snow's two-culture analysis of perceptions of science. How the general public decides whether or not to take supplements is quite different from the way a science-based regulatory agency makes decisions about a product's safety or effectiveness. People choose to take supplements for conscious or unconscious reasons that do not necessarily depend on science. This explains why, during hearings on barriers to implementation of Deshay, Congressman Burton implied that the FDA insufficiently recognizes the importance of spirituality in healing and the important role of botanical products and nutrition in healing. Reasons based on personal beliefs, spirituality among them, have convinced about half the adult population of the United States to use dietary supplements, if for no other reason than as a form of nutritional insurance. The supplement industry deliberately appeals to such beliefs when it argues for the right of people to choose to consume more or less safe products without government interference, whether or not these products have been proved effective through clinical trials. Science-based belief systems, on the other hand, explain why federal and private health agencies rarely recommend nutritional supplements as a replacement for foods. The 1995 Dietary Guidelines advised consumers that daily vitamin and mineral supplements are considered safe but are usually not needed by people who eat the variety of foods depicted in the Food Guide Pyramid. In recognition of the widespread use of supplements and the studies that show benefits for some of them, the 2000 Dietary Guidelines allowed that some people need a vitamin-mineral supplement to meet specific nutrient needs. Science-based arguments, however, have convinced many professionals of the need for skepticism, if not outrage, about the lack of evidence for the safety and efficacy of herbal and botanical supplements, as well as about their deregulated status. As explained by a science-minded lawyer concerned that FDA policies had become too lenient about health statements, the FDA proposal recognizes as an appropriate structure and function statement for a dietary supplement a claim that the product improves absent-mindedness. There are no foods that affect absent-mindedness. The depth and passion of the opposing views cannot be overstated. For example, the Journal of the American Medical Association's publication of studies indicating possible benefits from certain dietary supplements appears to have contributed to the abrupt dismissal of its distinguished editor. Factions of the American Medical Association opposed to alternative medicine were said to have worked to undermine his position. People may feel better when they take supplements, but should health officials use feelings as a basis for regulatory decisions? Or should the FDA instead take the lead in re-energizing a crucial phase of its basic mission to promote honest, rational, scientific medicine by vigorously combating its opposite? The issues of safety and efficacy raised by this deregulated marketplace should force us to consider carefully whether we should permit so great a reduction in the enforcement ability of the one government entity devoted to a science-based regulatory approach, unpopular though it may be. Yes, the FDA's current stance may appear too economically threatening to the supplement industry and too intrusive to some segments of the public. And yes, relatively few of these products do overt harm. Our society tolerates far more damage from handguns and automobiles than supplements are ever likely to cause, and we handle the demonstrably greater hazards of cigarettes and alcohol with warning labels. What really is at stake here is whether irreparable damage has been done to the ability of our federal regulatory system to ensure the safety of foods and supplements and to balance public health interests against the economic interests of corporations. 
Is it not in the public interest to demand that there be some federal system to guarantee that all those products on the shelves are safe and effective? Shouldn't there be some regulatory framework to control patently absurd or misleading claims? The resolution of differences of opinion about the value of dietary supplements is not well served by destroying the ability of a science-based agency to remove harmful products from the marketplace. A return to the pre-1906 days of rampant quackery hardly seems in the best interests of the country. Part 5. Inventing Technofoods As we saw in the last chapter, the nutritional attributes of foods are a natural selling point, and the advertising of health benefits increases sales. Food companies are vitally interested in the ways that they might take advantage of three approaches used by government and health officials to promote better diets. Education, supplements, and fortification or alteration of foods to make them healthier. Part one of this book explained how the food industry protects its interests by influencing federal dietary advice to the public. Part four discussed how makers and sellers of dietary supplements worked the system to obtain a free hand in marketing their products. Part four focuses on the third approach, strategies for improving the marketability of foods as healthy by adding nutrients or other supplements or by subtracting undesirable components. These days, food products constructed for this purpose are classified in their own special category and are variously called functional foods, designer foods, or sometimes nutraceuticals. I much prefer the designation technofoods, which, as my colleague Greg Drescher once explained, works well for want of a better pejorative term. Collectively, these designations refer to foods and beverages that have been constructed to confer health benefits beyond the nutritive value of the foods themselves. In developing techno-foods, manufacturers deliberately take advantage of the increasingly liberal regulatory environment for health claims to appeal to the public's desire for uncomplicated ways to follow dietary advice and achieve optimal health. By the definition used here, technofoods encompass an enormous range of products. Foods enriched or fortified with vitamins, minerals, protein, fiber, amino acids or fatty acids, as well as herbs, plant phytochemicals, and even wood pulp derivatives. They also include lesser evil foods that have been formulated to be low in calories, fat, sugar, salt, caffeine, or allergens, or to contain artificial substitutes for unwanted ingredients such as sugar or fat. As explained in Chapter 13, fortification clearly yields some health advantages, although most of the benefits claimed for this approach are uncertain. In part as a result of fortification strategies, the addition of vitamins and minerals to basic foods such as milk and flour, nutrient deficiencies now rarely occur among Americans hardly ever cause noticeable symptoms, and are observed mainly among people who consume patently inadequate diets or are ill. The increasingly common addition of vitamins and minerals to products as diverse as breakfast cereals, candy, and water, however, is unlikely to provide additional increments in health and raises concerns about the possible hazards of too much of a good thing. Chapter 14 addresses issues related to the addition of herbal and other non-nutritional dietary supplements to conventional foods. It also covers the lesser evil foods reduced in unwanted fat, sugar, or other factors. Such products, many of which would otherwise be relegated to the top of the food guide pyramid, were developed expressly to take advantage of the nutrient content, health, and structure function claims permitted by various acts of Congress. Because manufacturers developed these products precisely so that people would eat more of them, it is not surprising that the burgeoning availability of apparently healthy foods has had little effect on overall consumption of fat, sugar, or calories. As we have seen, recommended dietary patterns 
not single nutrients or foods, are associated with good health. Unless we change our overall diets and eat less, techno foods will not help us lose weight or reduce risk factors. As a final ironic twist, as explained in Chapter 15, healthy techno foods, such as those made with the no calorie fat substitute Olestra, appeal most to people who are already following dietary and other recommended health practices. It should be evident that the philosophical rationale for technofoods is flatly reductionist. The value of a food is reduced to its single functional ingredient. Underlying this philosophy is the conviction that if diets rich in fruits and vegetables protect against cancer and heart disease, then some component of those foods must be responsible. If a single component is responsible for the benefit, the argument continues, then that component will be even more beneficial if isolated, purified, and used in larger amounts. This logic is flawed in that it fails to consider the complexity of food composition and the interactions among food components. Throughout evolution, food plants developed hundreds of chemicals to ward off unwanted insects and predators, and a great many of these have been shown to stimulate detoxifying enzymes in people who eat them. Thus, almost any food plant, and oats, flaxseed, soybeans, tomatoes, carrots, garlic, onions, broccoli, cabbage, sprouts, citrus fruits, cranberries, grapes, and tea, are only the best studied examples, seems to protect against disease in clinical studies. The nutrients and other plant chemicals that occur in greatest amounts in these foods become candidates for use as magic bullets, but numerous other possibilities have barely been explored. Potentially protective components also have been isolated from fish, fermented dairy foods, and even beef. The complexity of food composition means that no single nutrient is likely to work nearly so well as a diet rich in the fruits and vegetables from which that nutrient was isolated. We shall see in these chapters that because techno foods offer manufacturers a genuine opportunity to promote sales, food and beverage companies go to extraordinary lengths to protect the marketing environment for such products. Thus, the development of these foods has produced at least three undesirable results. A further blurring of the distinctions among foods, supplements, and drugs— a further erosion of the ability of federal regulators to protect the public from harmful substances in foods, and most important, a further increase in public confusion about how best to achieve recommended diets. Chapter 13. Go Forth and Fortify In developing technofoods fortified with essential nutrients and designed to be healthier, Food companies were responding not only to the marketing advantage of such products, but also to the demands of federal health officials in what appeared to be a win-win situation. By the late 1980s, consensus about the health benefits of recommended diets, those that followed the dietary guidelines, seemed almost universal. Because Americans were spending an ever-increasing proportion of their food dollars on products and meals prepared outside the home, nutritionists and health officials believed that the industries responsible for pre-prepared foods should join homemakers as primary targets of policy recommendations. Many of us believed that if we could influence the food industry to improve the nutritional quality of its products by creating foods reduced in fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, sugar, and salt, but higher in fiber, then people would buy them enthusiastically, and everyone, industry and the public alike, would benefit. We could not imagine that the food industry indeed would respond to this idea, but with a vengeance. In their quest to promote Eat More, food and beverage companies rushed to create products that could be marketed as more healthful, whether or not they really would improve patterns of dietary intake. This chapter reviews the ways in which food companies added vitamins and minerals to foods at all levels of the USDA's food guide pyramid, top as well as bottom. We shall see, however, that fortification does not automatically make diets better and that it raises questions about potentially harmful effects.
The Impetus for Healthier Foods The first formal demands for creation of healthier food products appeared as early as 1980, when, as part of its first 10-year plan for improving the nation's health, the U.S. Public Health Service called for a 20% reduction in sodium levels in processed foods to be achieved by 1990. Those who devised this plan anticipated that to promote overall improvements in nutritional status, major food processors and distributors will incorporate nutrition principles and concepts into their food and marketing strategies and messages, presumably to the extent then possible under Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and Federal Trade Commission, FTC, regulations. A stronger impetus to develop healthy food products came in the form of policy recommendations in the 1988 Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. The report's principal conclusion was that overconsumption of certain dietary components is now a major concern for Americans. While many food factors are involved, chief among them is the disproportionate consumption of foods high in fats, often at the expense of foods high in complex carbohydrates and fiber that may be more conducive to health. Because the main contributors of fat to American diets are meat, poultry, dairy products, and fried and processed foods, the report issued a challenge to the food industry. Food manufacturers can contribute to improving the quality of the American diet by increasing the availability of palatable, easily prepared food products that will help people to follow the dietary principles outlined here. Because the public is becoming increasingly conscious of the role of nutrition in health, development of such products should also benefit the food industry. In 1990, the Public Health Service's second 10-year plan made even more explicit requests. It called on food companies to offer for sale by the year 2000 at least 5,000 processed food products lower in fat and saturated fat. In 1986, about 2,500 such products were on the market, and this goal was designed to double their number. In recognition of the potential for increased sales that might be generated by responding to this mandate, food companies quickly accelerated development of fat substitutes and produced items such as reduced-calorie cheesecake mixes and McDonald's McLean hamburgers, which replaced some of the beef fat with agar derivatives, vegetable proteins, and water. By 1991, the industry already had exceeded the goal for the year 2000 and was marketing 5,600 reduced-fat products. From 1992 on, about 2,000 new reduced-fat products were introduced annually, along with hundreds of other products that were lower in calories, salt, cholesterol, or sugar, or contained added fiber or calcium. By 1996... 38% of new food products were designed for some nutritional purpose, and 40% of these nutritionally modified products were lower in fat. To the food industry and some federal officials, such products offered a pragmatic solution to a fundamental dilemma. Most people interested in following dietary advice will not do so unless they like what they are eating and the food industry has no interest in creating products it cannot sell. One way to address the dilemma is to concede that people are going to eat junk foods anyway and encourage the food industry to create healthier versions. This idea seemed especially attractive because food companies consider new products the key to expanding sales. Nutritional enhancements might give new products a favorable edge in the fiercely competitive marketplace for processed foods, even though labeling a food as healthy was no sure guarantee of success. The McLean burgers, for example, failed miserably and were soon taken off the market. Nevertheless, food marketers recognized that the success rate was higher for innovative products, and the success of even a few nutritionally enhanced foods would provide a strong incentive to produce others. From 1989 to 1993, 
nutritionally enhanced foods and beverages in 37 categories rose from 26% to 30% of all sales, an increase much better than that for regular versions of the products. There was every reason to think that such products would do even better if health claims could be made for them. Indeed, the changes in federal laws that permitted statements about health benefits on package labels stimulated further interest in creating food products for specific nutritional purposes. A final impetus derived from the way such products could be marketed. Nutritionally enhanced foods could be advertised in positive terms, for their beneficial attributes, rather than for the absence of undesirable factors. Industry is betting that consumers, after years of being bombarded with negative health messages to cut back on fat, cholesterol, and sodium, are ready to warm up to foods that emphasize the positive benefits of newly added ingredients, even if the scientific community has not yet concluded that they are truly beneficial. These kinds of societal pressures gave food manufacturers just the rationale they needed to create even more nutritionally enhanced techno-foods, beginning with the addition of vitamins and minerals. Nutrification, Fortifying and Enriching Foods Like much else in nutrition, fortification has an eventful history. The very first techno-foods were fortified or enriched. To explain the difference, vitamins and minerals are added to white flour to compensate for the loss of nutrients that occurs when whole grains are milled. For example, unfortified white flour contains 25% or less of vitamin B6, magnesium, and zinc, and less than 10% of the vitamin E found in the whole grain. The white flour sold in stores is considered fortified because vitamins, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, and more recently folic acid, and one mineral, iron, are added at higher levels than those found in the original grain. In contrast, enrichment is the restoration of nutrients to their original level in the unprocessed food. Despite these technical distinctions, the term fortification usually refers to any addition of vitamins or minerals to food. As a public health approach, fortification was designed to overcome widespread deficiencies of certain key nutrients in the diets of the general population. The practice dates to the early 1830s, when a French chemist advocated the addition of iodine to table salt to prevent goiter, enlarged thyroid glands. Europeans began adding iodine to salt in the early 1900s, but large-scale additions of other nutrients did not become possible until later in the century when scientists identified vitamins and learned how to purify and synthesize them in large quantities. In the United States, a 1918 survey found one-third of the population of Michigan, where soils are particularly deficient in iodine, to have enlarged thyroid glands. In some areas, the prevalence exceeded 60%. Within just 10 years from the time iodized salt was introduced in 1924, officials were iodizing more than 90% of the salt sold in Michigan. The happy result was that goiter had all but disappeared. In Detroit, for example, the prevalence of goiter fell from 47% to 2% among schoolchildren and to about 1% among adults. This remarkable achievement encouraged the use of iodized salt throughout the country and virtually eliminated iodine deficiency as a public health problem. Vitamin D was first added to milk in 1931, but fortification truly took off just prior to World War II when the FDA established a standard of identity for enriched flour that went into effect in 1942. A standard of identity is a recipe for the nutrient composition of a specific food such as enriched bread. The food must contain each of the elements of that recipe in order to be marketed under that designation. The FDA soon established standards of identity for other foods. Cornmeal and grits in 1943, 
pasta in 1946, enriched bread in 1952, and rice in 1958. In the 1950s, manufacturers began to fortify cereals with additional vitamins, minerals, and protein at levels higher than in the original foods. The initial purpose of fortifying cereals and grains was to raise the intake of the four nutrients then considered most deficient in the diets of the population, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, and iron. To ensure adequate intake, the standard specified higher amounts than in the original grain. Even though losses of all the other vitamins and minerals in whole grains were just as substantial, nutritionists considered those nutrients less critical to public health. As a public health strategy, fortification and enrichment, nutrification, seemed to make good sense because they were the most rapidly applied the most flexible and the most socially acceptable intervention method of changing the intake of nutrients without a vast education effort and without changing the current food patterns of a given population. The principle of nutrification challenges a long-standing belief that the consumer must consciously desire and be involved in nutritional change. Fortification strategies especially appeared to make sense because nutrient deficiencies occurred most commonly among low-income populations without enough money to buy a variety of foods or enough education to make the most nutritious choices. Because nutrient deficiencies were still observed in areas with much poverty, the 1969 White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health strongly recommended the accelerated use of fortification, particularly of breakfast cereals and other foods likely to be basic sources of calories for ethnic, cultural, socioeconomic, and regional groups at especially high risk of inadequate nutrient intake. In response, the FDA raised the levels of thiamine, niacin, and riboflavin in the standard of identity for grain foods and more than doubled the iron standard. The amounts of these nutrients in the food supply immediately increased. Indeed, the availability of iron rose so quickly that health officials began to be concerned that the food supply contained too much of it. The FDA reduced the standard but then increased it again some years later. During the 1970s, various groups used data indicating that a significant proportion of the population was deficient in one or more nutrients as a basis for proposals to expand enrichment formulas to include up to 10 vitamins and minerals. But the FDA rejected these out of fear that they might lead to excessive, unbalanced, and potentially harmful intake of essential nutrients. Does fortification work? An important question is whether fortification really does improve health. For some nutrients, the answer is an unequivocal yes, but for others, it is less certain. Today, the laws of about half the communities in the United States require water to be fluoridated to help prevent tooth decay. FDA standards of identity require salt to be iodized, milk to contain vitamin D, margarine to be fortified with vitamin A, and grain products to contain added thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, iron, and, more recently, folic acid. Fortification demonstrably raises the quantity of nutrients available in the food supply. Amounts of iron, thiamine, niacin, and riboflavin are about 50% higher than they were prior to fortification and 20 to 30% higher than they were in 1970. As a result of increasing fortification, grain products contributed 37% of the iron in the U.S. food supply in 1970, but 51% in 1994, and they also contributed major proportions of the other fortifying nutrients. These increases surely help prevent deficiencies of the particular nutrients used in fortification. The actual proportion of vitamin or mineral deficiencies eliminated as a result of fortification, however, is not easy to determine. On the one hand, the almost complete elimination of rickets, goiter, and pellagra 
invariably attributed to fortification of foods with vitamin D, iodine, and niacin, respectively, is considered one of the great public health achievements of the 20th century, as is the 40-60% to 60 reduction in tooth decay that followed the introduction of fluoridated water. In some cases, however, factors other than fortification may have been equally or more important in eliminating nutrient deficiencies. The relationship of niacin fortification to pellagra best illustrates this point. Death rates from pellagra were declining well before the initiation of mandatory niacin fortification, and the rates consistently fell by half every four years, from 1938, when there were 3,200 deaths, to 1954, when there were fewer than 200. Congress mandated niacin fortification in 1943, but repealed it in 1946, and only 22 states required it by 1948. Under these circumstances, the proportion of pellagra deaths prevented by niacin fortification is difficult to disentangle from the changes in food prices, income, food availability, food habits, and economic growth that also were taking place at that time. People were eating better and more varied diets that could prevent pellagra as well as deficiencies of all other essential nutrients, those that are used in fortification and those that are not. This point brings us to the question of the role of single nutrients in overall diets. In that context, the effect of folic acid fortification is of great current interest. In deciding to what level grain products should be fortified with folic acid, the FDA estimated that everyone who ate fortified foods would increase intake of the vitamin, particularly those who ate the largest amounts of fortified grain products. Indeed, once folic acid was added to grains, increases in average levels of folate in blood across the population became evident almost immediately. By mid-1999, it was apparent that blood levels of folate had doubled among adults who ate fortified grain products and that low levels had been almost completely eliminated. As an added benefit, blood levels of homocysteine, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, also had decreased. Fortification of folic acid appeared to increase its availability in the food supply, its dietary intake, and its level in the blood of people who eat foods fortified with folic acid, all in proportion to the amount of grain products consumed. Whether it also leads to fewer babies born with neural tube defects, the purpose of its addition to grains remains questionable. Nevertheless, food companies are increasingly adding folic acid to their products and using that fact in marketing. A 1999 box of General Mills Total Cereal, for example, proclaimed 100% folic acid, and its rear panel contained this message, Saving Babies Together, a message from the March of Dimes, helps spread the word about folic acid and helps save a baby. Whether higher levels of folic acid fortification improve the health of babies or adults is difficult to determine, in part because people who already eat the best diets those who are wealthier, better educated, and more concerned about their health, are the most likely to increase their nutrient intake by eating fortified foods. They also are the most likely to be consuming additional nutrients from dietary supplements. Whether fortification confers additional health benefits on such people is difficult to say with certainty and requires more sophisticated kinds of research studies than are currently available. Furthermore, fortification raises some concerns about the safety of voluntary fortification. When the FDA establishes standards of identity for fortified products, it does so on the assumption that consuming nutrients in multiples of RDAs, whether or not beneficial, would at least be harmless. No such determinations apply to voluntary fortification, however. That it is overly optimistic to assume the inherent safety of nutrients added to the food supply is best illustrated by the case of iron fortification. Iron deficiency and its most severe consequence, anemia, 
have long been the most prevalent conditions of undernutrition among Americans, but current rates are quite low, except among low-income and minority toddlers, adolescent girls, and women of childbearing age. Too much iron, however, is toxic. Most people are protected from taking in too much iron because this mineral is poorly absorbed. Indeed, absorption usually acts as a firm control over the amount of iron in the body. More iron is absorbed when body iron stores are low, less when stores are adequate. Because humans do not have any way to excrete much iron, other than through menstrual and other blood losses, poor absorption protects most of us against accumulating toxic levels of iron in the body. Perhaps as many as a million Americans, however, have a genetic condition, known as hemochromatosis, that causes them to absorb slightly more iron than they need. Over time, iron stores build up to toxic levels, and unless treated by bleeding, iron overload can lead to liver and heart problems, and in severe cases can cause death. For people with this condition, usually male adults and postmenopausal women, excess iron in the food supply represents an ongoing hazard. As a result of food fortification, the amount of iron in the food supply increased by about one-third from 1970 to 1994 and is now more than double the amount necessary to maintain adequate iron status in the population. This increase has helped reduce rates of iron deficiency anemia to their present low levels. Listings of hemochromatosis on death certificates, however, increased by 60% from 1979 to 1992. This percentage seems high to some investigators, but others believe that it underestimates the actual number of deaths because the condition is routinely underdiagnosed, often misdiagnosed, and probably underreported. The trade-off between the competing risks of iron deficiency anemia and iron overload has led some health officials to recognize that it is quite possible to have too much of a good thing, and several have called for a re-evaluation of current fortification policies. Industry-initiated additions of iron to the food supply may well be contributing to a condition harmful to at least a million adult Americans, far more than the 2,000 or so infants conceived with neural tube defects. The discrepancy in these rates raises questions about the scientific basis of fortification policies. The exceedingly high intake of calcium and other nutrients now obtained from fortified foods and supplements also raise the possibility of undesirable health consequences unknown at this time. Given the complexities of this situation, do the potential benefits of fortification outweigh the potential risks? For product manufacturers, the answer is an unequivocal yes. They need only look at the greatly increased sales to women concerned about osteoporosis of calcium-fortified juices and fruit drinks made by Tropicana, Minute Maid, and Campbell. Whether widespread fortification produces real health benefits, however, is less evident. It might seem intuitively obvious that a food supply that contains more vitamins and minerals is better for health than one that contains fewer of them, and food marketers take full advantage of this idea. But this relationship is not easy to demonstrate in economies where food intake is sufficient or in excess. Once a food supply contains enough nutrients, more will improve health only among people whose intake is less than optimal. Because fortified foods cost more, they may be beyond the reach of people who run the greatest risk of deficiencies. Instead, they tend to benefit most the people who need them least. Furthermore, fortification has long been suspected of undermining efforts to educate the public about the need to follow recommended dietary patterns rather than increasing the intake of single nutrients or foods. Can we really accept that superfortification will eliminate our need to select widely from conventional foods to balance nutrient intake? 
Americans are intrigued with the notion that a pill or a potion can settle all nutritional needs. Thus, we regard fortified cupcakes and synthesized orange juice as necessary steps in achieving that goal. Dumping nutrients into such foods will not neutralize their detrimental effects or make them more healthful. Furthermore, fortification schemes serve primarily to add to the public's confusion about nutrition. By their nature, fortification practices discourage the most desirable modifications in food selection behavior. This point is important because the nutrients used in fortification make up only a small fraction of the total number of nutrients known to be essential in human diets. Those nutrients and other key components, the numerous types of fiber and phytochemicals, for example, can be obtained only from foods. People who eat fruits and vegetables obtain vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other food components that are not covered by the rules governing standards of identity. These missing ingredients make fortification a techno fix with inherently limited impact because this method fails to address fundamental causes of inadequate dietary intake, such as poverty or insufficient education. In the most successful examples of the use of fortification, the elimination of goiter by adding iodine to salt and the reduction in tooth decay by adding fluoride to drinking water, the added nutrients replace minerals that are missing or insufficient in local soils and water supplies. In these cases, fortification benefits everyone who lives in geochemically deprived areas. In these few instances, fortification is by far the best approach to improving overall public health. With regard to other nutrients, however, the issues are more complicated. The fortification of cereals, milk, and margarine, for example, addresses vitamin and mineral deficiencies that are caused largely by poverty or other socioeconomic conditions that affect a relatively small proportion of the American population. In an ideal world, nutritional deficiencies among such groups would be corrected through education, jobs, or some form of income support, all better overall strategies than fortification. In the real world, however, it is easier to fortify foods than to eliminate underlying economic disparities, which explains why fortification so often appears to be the most sensible option for dealing with dietary deficiencies. Such broader issues also apply to the marketing of the new functional techno-foods, as described in the next chapters. Chapter 14. Beyond Fortification Making Foods Functional Because all foods and drinks include ingredients, calories, nutrients, or water that are essential for life, any one of them has the potential to be marketed for its health benefits. Many vitamins and minerals participate in energy-yielding biochemical reactions, and the phrase, contains vitamins essential for energy, would accurately describe just about any food except pure sugar, starch, or alcohol, which have calories but no nutrients. Accordingly, when Congress in 1990 instructed the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to consider authorizing certain claims for the health benefits of conventional foods, and then in 1994 demanded that it permit less restrictive claims for dietary supplements, companies immediately began to market foods for their favorable nutritional properties. Functional Foods as Dietary Medicines Food manufacturers had every reason to be optimistic. The Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, DSHEA, of 1994, permitted supplement companies to market their products with statements of structure function that could hardly be distinguished from FDA-authorized health claims. Deshay also provided a new regulatory opportunity for functional foods. They could now be marketed as dietary supplements using such claims. The benefits of this alternative were self-evident. For example, in response to the announcement of its designer foods project, the NCI received an 8-inch stack of telephone messages mostly from industry officials. 
the potential market for foods with drug-like effects could easily encompass the entire adult population because conditions such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and cancer might be expected to affect almost everyone who lives long enough. The pressure to develop therapeutic foods derived directly from food company imperatives to overcome the infamously slow growth, a mere 1-2% to annually, of the food industry as a whole. The companies could see that low-fat products and dietary supplements were doing much better than the industry average. Thus, functional foods presented a most welcome opportunity. Using the broadest definition, one that includes supplements, organics, health foods, and lesser evils, functional foods were estimated to have earned $86 billion in sales in 1996, with a growth rate of nearly 8% more than in the previous year and to have risen to $91.7 billion just one year later. Together with supplements, functional conventional foods were said to be worth $14.7 billion in 1998 and were projected to be worth $49 billion by 2010. The size of this potential market encouraged virtually every large food or drug company, Johnson & Johnson, Cargill, DuPont, Unilever and Monsanto, for example, to establish functional foods divisions. Marketing opportunities also have spawned a thriving consulting industry that offers frequent seminars and conferences on growth opportunities in this area and ways to build value and profits. Best of all, the new foods could be marketed with Eat More messages. Although food companies had long been producing fat substitutes and sweeteners, foods made from them, and lesser evil foods lower in fat, cholesterol, sugar, and salt, they could now take a less puritanical approach. Manufacturers could shift the emphasis from removing the bad to enhancing the good, thereby opening up a vast array of commercial possibilities. The sections that follow illustrate some of these possibilities. Herbal Supplemented Everything The search for a magic bullet is behind most of the new functional food products marketed to date. Surely the prize for the greatest triumph of marketing ingenuity goes to the vast array of herbal supplemented cereals, snack foods, and drinks sold in the guise of dietary supplements just so that they can be labeled with structure function claims. The variety of herbs used in these products is extensive and is becoming more so, whether or not there is any evidence that they are safe or that they do any good when added to foods. Although the products must comply with the rules for labeling supplements, these rules do not require disclosure of ingredients present in minute amounts or of the amounts of ingredients in mixtures. The New Morning Company's breakfast cereals, Ginseng Crunch, for extra energy, and Gink O's improves blood flow to the brain to sustain memory, each of which is labeled explicitly as an herbal dietary supplement, say that they contain 60 milligrams of the active ingredient per serving, but give no indication of the significance of such a dose. Similarly, a rocket juice cranberry echinacea drink, a traditional herbal defense with vitamin C, is simply said to contain a hundred milligrams of the herb. No further explanation follows. Because a 16-ounce serving of this beverage contains two ounces of sugars, from juice extracts, as the principal source of its 230 calories, it is difficult to view this product as anything more than yet another heavily sweetened soft drink. The overburdened FDA has taken a dim view of such products and deals with them as best it can. In early 2000, the agency issued a warning to Robert's American Gourmet about label violations for its spirulina spirals because they did not contain enough vitamin B12 to claim that they are a good source, for its echinacea shells, because saying that this food can be an effective antibiotic constitutes a drug claim, 
and for other products considered misbranded because of misleading or illegal label statements. Reportedly, the FDA warning letter stated, We note that ingredients such as echinacea, ginkgo biloba, St. John's wort, cat's claw, kava kava, and spirulina are listed on the labels of several of your products. FDA has not issued a food additive regulation authorizing the use of these ingredients in food. Additionally, we are not aware of a basis for concluding that these ingredients are generally recognized as safe for use in conventional food. The FDA also had issued similar warnings to Haynes about its kitchen prescription soup line. Fiber and Soy Supplemented Foods In response to petitions from Quaker Oats, Kellogg, and Protein Technologies International, respectively, the FDA authorized health claims for soluble fiber from oats in 1997, for psyllium husk in 1998, and for soy protein in 1999. As we shall see, the purpose of these requests was to increase market share. In substantiating the claims, the companies drew on studies of single foods or food components in isolation from their dietary context. Despite the ambiguity of the results of such studies, the FDA authorized each claim. It had to. Under the various laws and court decisions governing the FDA's actions in this area, the agency must approve claims backed up by well-conducted studies, no matter how out of context they may be or how quickly contradicted by further research. The health claims for oat bran, psyllium fiber, and soy proteins illustrate these problems. Oat bran In January 1996, when the FDA first proposed to approve the Quaker Oats request for a claim for oat fiber, the company placed a full-page newspaper announcement in the New York Times. Why is this man smiling? FDA proposes first food-specific health claim. Diets high in oatmeal and low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. When the FDA issued its final rule in January 1997, the company again announced the news in full-page advertisements. Now he has another reason to smile. Quaker oatmeal. Oh, what those oats can do. General Mills also bought full-page advertisements. FDA announces heart-healthy news. So go ahead. Eat to your heart's content. The one and only Cheerios. An additional reason for smiling was the pretty good pop in sales now expected, and the immediate jump in the prices of shares of stock in Quaker, General Mills, and Kellogg, all of which would be using the claim to promote their products. In authorizing the oat fiber claim, the FDA required the qualifying phrase, as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol, so as not to mislead people into thinking that eating oatmeal was sufficient to reduce the risk of heart disease. Although cereal makers include that phrase on boxes, they do so grudgingly. For example, the Cheerios box says, as part of a heart-healthy diet, the soluble fiber in Cheerios may help reduce cholesterol. The Quaker Oat brand label splits the message into three distinct parts. Soluble fiber from oat bran, large type, as part of a low-saturated fat, low-cholesterol diet, small type, may reduce the risk of heart disease enclosed in a red heart. A Quaker Oats advertisement in the March 1999 Journal of the American Dietetic Association asserted that such studies documented the cholesterol-lowering effect of soluble fiber, beta-glucan, from oats. Some studies have attributed a 4-8% to 8 decrease in total cholesterol to the addition of oatmeal to a healthy diet. Other studies included oatmeal in a specific low-fat diet, which resulted in a 10-12% to 12 decrease in total cholesterol. The FDA said, however, that just 20 studies produced statistically significant reductions of blood cholesterol levels. Of the remaining 17, it disqualified one for poor methods and found the rest to have yielded equivocal effects at best. 
Despite these discrepancies, the FDA agreed that the preponderance of evidence supported a cholesterol-lowering effect, although a small one, from eating oat fiber as part of an otherwise low-fat diet. Does oat fiber lower blood cholesterol levels? Of course it does, conditionally. Like any other whole-grain cereal, oats are high in fiber and contribute to the cholesterol-lowering effects of diets low in fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Whether oats are sufficiently different from other fiber sources to merit their own special health claim is far less evident. The potential marketing benefits, not the science, explain companies' persistent attempts to obtain FDA authorization for health claims. Soy Protein In May 1998, Protein Technologies International, a division of DuPont that manufactures isolated soy proteins for commercial use, petitioned the FDA to permit claims that soy protein could help reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. By August, the FDA had completed its initial review, and it published the proposed rule in November. This rapid response reflected pressure from Congress and industry to authorize health claims quickly, and it also reflected the FDA's acceptance of the validity of studies suggesting that about an ounce of soy protein per day can reduce blood cholesterol by about 10% in people with high cholesterol levels. The soy story requires a brief digression into soy science. To begin with, soybeans and their derivatives, miso, soy sauce, soy milk, tofu, and tempeh, are traditional foods in Asian diets. Asians who consume soy foods display lower rates of coronary heart disease, breast cancer, and other conditions than North Americans. On this basis, Researchers have examined the effects of isolated soybean components, proteins, isoflavones, and fiber, on such conditions. Isoflavones are phytochemicals, in this case, estrogen-like compounds that accompany the proteins after they are extracted. Investigators wondered, for example, whether isoflavones separately or with proteins might be responsible for the low rates of menopausal symptoms and breast cancer among Asian women. They also suggested that American women should eat more soy foods in order to gain such benefits. As early as 1981, researchers reported that soy proteins reduced blood cholesterol levels and soon proposed soy proteins as a means of treating high blood cholesterol. When a review paper concluded that soy protein with isoflavones lowered blood cholesterol levels, the New York Times warned readers to prepare for the onslaught. Soy cookies, soy bread, soy muffins, soy milkshakes, soy pretzels, soy soups, and a new surely improved version of that old unfavorite, the soy burger. In September 1998, the Center for Science in the Public Interest welcomed its Nutrition Action Health Letter subscribers to the overblown and undersubstantiated world of soy claims, warning that most of the claims came from the company's marketing departments. This skepticism was soon justified by independent studies suggesting that substituting soy for other proteins in the diet might have little effect on the coronary risk of North Americans. Studies also suggested that soy might have some disadvantages, such as increasing the risk of coronary heart disease or of breast cancer. Despite such concerns, the FDA tentatively concluded that soy protein, independent of its isoflavone content, reduced coronary risk and merited a health claim. 25 grams of soy protein combined with a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. To qualify for this claim, a product would need to contain about a teaspoonful, 6.25 grams, of soy protein per serving. To reap the benefit, people would need to eat four servings per day. Many products on the market were expected to meet the 6.25 gram requirement. Soy proteins, in the form of isolated proteins, concentrates, or flour, already were common ingredients in food products where they served as extenders and stabilizers. 
1995 estimate suggested that 12,000 products containing soy proteins were on the market, and more were soon to follow. New functional soy foods were rapidly joining this market. Breads, cereals, power bars, drinks, and even potato chips. As soon as the FDA authorized the claim, soy food companies announced the decision in the usual full-page New York Times advertisements. One published on October 24, 1999 from a soy veggie burger company, owned by Kraft Foods' Philip Morris, said, It's official. Soy is heart healthy. The new health claim was expected to stimulate creation of even more new products, especially because other giant food companies such as Kellogg, ConAgra, General Mills, and Campbell's Soup all were pursuing ways to take advantage of the claim. Archer Daniels Midland, the world's dominant processor of soybeans, also was planning to cash in on this marketing opportunity by entering into partnerships with pasta and cereal makers. Would such products succeed? They might, if people could be induced to view soy as mainstream, rather than as a health food. Even if the scientific justification for the soy claim raised questions, marketers were optimistic about its economic justification, and with good reason. Sales of soy beverages, for example, grew more than 82% in 1999, leading Best Foods to back its Nutra Blend product with a $20 million advertising budget. As consumers become more open to the message of soy health benefits, they're looking for these products, and now is the time to advertise. Lesser Evils Lighter Fats Fat Substitutes much current research on functional foods focuses on creating fats and oils either reduced in unwanted saturated or trans fatty acids, or enriched in desirable monounsaturated or omega-3 fatty acids or vitamins. By the late 1990s, omega-3 enriched infant formulas, noodles, margarines, beverages, and eggs were widely available in Japan and Europe. American companies still were trying to solve technical problems and had not released products to U.S. markets. I first saw omega-3 eggs in American markets late in 2000. According to package inserts, the cage-free hens laying these eggs had been fed organically grown flax seed or an unspecified all-natural vegetarian feed. The labels also state that the eggs are certified organic and contain no growth hormones, medications, antibiotics, or pesticides. The package insert for one brand claims that egg omega-3, like that in fish oil, helps maintain normal blood pressure, supports brain and eye function, and provides important nutrients for pregnant women and nursing infants. Like other eggs, these contain about 70 calories each, along with 1.5 grams of saturated fat and more than two-thirds the daily value of cholesterol, 215 milligrams. In early 2001, a half-dozen such eggs cost more than $2 in my local Manhattan market. Also at this time, the spread sections of supermarkets were filled with many brands of lighter margarines and those reduced in trans fatty acids. Light margarines are stabilized mixtures, emulsions, of oil and varying amounts of water. Trans-fat-free margarines are made from vegetable oils that have not been hydrogenated. The mixtures are not particularly stable, and these products cannot be used in standard recipes for cooking or baking. The most important development in this field, however, was the late 1990s introduction by Procter & Gamble of its new fat substitute, Olestra, to which the next chapter is devoted. Food as a Techno Fix Heinz Ketchup Techno foods offer a reductionist approach to choosing healthful diets. That such approaches can lead to even more absurd consequences than those already mentioned is illustrated by the attempted transformation of Heinz Ketchup into a functional food. Early in 1999, 
Heinz placed an advertisement in the New York Times magazine. It shows a bottle of Heinz ketchup with the headline, Lycopene may help reduce the risk of prostate and cervical cancer. Asterisk. The asterisk refers readers to a review article on the health benefits of lycopene. At the time, I was surprised to see an advertisement with so blatant a claim for disease protection because the FDA had not authorized a lycopene and cancer claim for package labels, and the Federal Trade Commission usually defers to guidelines of the FDA in such matters. Furthermore, ketchup contains processed tomatoes, sugars, and salt, in that order, and could hardly be considered a health food, not least because it typically is used as a garnish for hamburgers and fried potatoes. The advertisement singled out one component of ketchup, lycopene, a plant pigment naturally present in tomatoes and other fruits and vegetables, and it clearly associated ketchup with cancer prevention by including a prominent endorsement from the Cancer Research Foundation of America. Eating tomatoes is demonstrably good for health, as all fruits and vegetables contain a variety of components protective against disease. Ketchup, however, seems a bit of a stretch. Under the FDA's rules, support in a single scientific publication fails to meet the criteria for scientific substantiation of health claims because it does not reflect significant scientific agreement as a result of a deliberate review by a government or private health agency. Before Deshaies, so blatant a disease claim would have promptly attracted the attention of both FDA and FTC. In response to my queries, however, an FDA official reminded me that this was an advertisement, not a label, and hence was not a concern of his agency. He referred me to the FTC. An FTC official said the matter was not public information and could not be discussed. Nevertheless, the FTC was reported to be investigating the claim and to be especially interested in what was being said on a Heinz-sponsored website, www.lycopene.org. It dropped the investigation when Heinz discontinued the claims. Heinz, in the meantime, reported a 4% increase in market share as a result of media accounts of the virtues of lycopene, especially when this phytochemical is present in cooked tomatoes. This sales advantage was enough of an incentive to marketers to continue using single scientific articles as a basis for health claims in advertisements and more such attempts were sure to follow. From this selection of examples, it should be evident that functional foods are more about marketing than health. By adding functional ingredients to foods, marketers are attempting to transform junk foods into health foods or to give foods already classified at the base of the pyramid a bit more of an edge. Despite weak or ambiguous evidence for significant health benefits from functional ingredients, the public will buy foods perceived as healthier, provided that they taste good and are reasonably priced. Overall, the evidence for an economic benefit of health claims is convincing, except when cost and taste considerations interfere. With so many companies now claiming health benefits, the industry is beginning to be concerned that the market will become oversaturated with such claims. If people become accustomed to viewing foods as medicines, the functional foods approach could backfire. People might stop eating such foods if they do not feel better when they eat them, because the products do not work, or if they do feel better, because the products are no longer needed. As already noted, taste and cost are also important considerations. Restaurant critics tend to give thumbs-down reviews to techno foods, and cost is always an issue in food choice, especially when people are expected to pay premium prices for uncertain health benefits. Overall, functional foods reinforce the misleading idea that health benefits depend on single ingredients, and they divert attention from the need to promote healthful dietary patterns. As we will see in the next chapter, reductionist approaches, issues of taste and cost, and the extraordinary efforts taken by companies to obtain approval for techno-foods are illustrated by Procter & Gamble's decades-long persistence in seeking FDA approval to market its fat substitute, Olestra, for use in snack and other foods.
Chapter 15 Selling the Ultimate Techno Food Olestra I was no longer a member of the FDA's Food Advisory Committee during the years when it was considering approval of Procter & Gamble's P&G fat substitute Olestra, but I followed its deliberations closely. On June 17, 1998, the committee confirmed a judgment that it had made more than two years earlier. Once again, it agreed that Olestra was reasonably certain to cause no harm as a food additive. The members did, however, advise the FDA that foods containing this substance should carry a warning statement. This product contains Olestra. Olestra may cause abdominal cramping and loose stools. Olestra inhibits the absorption of some vitamins and other nutrients. Vitamins A, D, E, and K have been added. This peculiar decision, judging Olestra safe while alerting consumers to its potential hazards, was the culmination of P&G's 30-year struggle to convince the FDA to approve Olestra for marketing. The company's persistence in that effort is easily understood. Olestra is P&G's name for the ultimate in lesser evil fat substitutes, sucrose polyester. Sucrose polyester is a sugar-based compound that retains the sensory and physical properties of natural food fats, but is neither digested nor absorbed by the human body, and therefore yields no calories. In theory, substitution of Olestra for natural fats could help people reduce their intake of calories, fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol, and thus reduce risks for obesity and diseases related to it, coronary heart disease, certain cancers, and diabetes. The potential uses of Olestra in food preparation and the potential economic returns to P&G investors could be very large indeed. The reasons why the FDA took so long to approve Olestra also are readily understood. The use of Olestra raises health issues that are not easy to resolve. Olestra is an oil-like compound that is not digested. As such, it might be expected to behave in the body like mineral oil, which has laxative effects and interferes with the absorption of nutrients, vitamins A, D, E, and K, phytochemicals, and drugs that are soluble in fat. A second concern is quantity. As a substitute cooking fat, Olestra might be eaten in very large amounts. Although P&G had conducted many studies of Olestra, these lasted only a few weeks or months, not nearly long enough to reveal any long-term effects on digestive function or on depletion of essential vitamins. Furthermore, P&G itself, rather than independent investigators, had conducted nearly all of the studies on Olestra. The company was responsible for the studies because food additive laws require petitioners to demonstrate that substances are safe before the FDA approves them. Congress does not grant the FDA a mandate or funds to conduct independent evaluations of additives under review. An additional problem is that food additive regulations require only that companies demonstrate safety and technical effects the companies do not have to prove that their products improve health. Thus, the FDA could not require P&G to demonstrate that Olestra really does help people reduce caloric intake, chronic disease risk, or obesity. And the company made no attempt to do so during the approval process. If Olestra indeed produced long-term benefits, there was no way to know about them. With questions about long-term safety and benefits impossible to resolve with the information available, the FDA approved Olestra but required a warning notice. Unlike drugs, which also are approved on the basis of limited testing by manufacturers and must carry warnings of any side effects, Olestra does not require a doctor's prescription. Unlike other food additives that carry warning notices, such as sulfites, artificial sweeteners, or even psyllium husk, Olestra was the first additive likely to be consumed in large quantities. A one-ounce serving of potato chips contains up to two teaspoons, ten grams. In contrast, 
diet soft drinks contain only milligram amounts of artificial sweeteners, and Kellogg's Ensemble cereals were designed to contain 2.4 grams of psyllium husk per serving. On quantitative grounds alone, Olestra raised unprecedented public health and regulatory issues. It should be evident from even this brief introduction that the case of Olestra is well worth attention. Olestra is the most ironic of techno foods. It is designed to encourage people to eat more top of the pyramid snack foods. Made with Olestra, such foods may be fat free, but they are not calorie free. And health conscious consumers, the group most likely to be enthusiastic about Olestra products, might be paying a price for their concern about fat reduction in the form of a loss of protective vitamins and phytochemicals just because these are soluble in fat. A 30-Year Regulatory Saga P&G researchers discovered sucrose polyester accidentally during an unsuccessful 1968 search for fats that could more easily be digested by premature infants. Conventional fats are composed of a backbone of a small sugar, glycerol, to which three fatty acids are attached, one to each of three linkage sites on the sugar. P&G scientists replaced the glycerol with sucrose, common table sugar, to which up to eight fatty acids could be attached. The resulting olestra molecule is so much larger than natural fats that it cannot be broken down either by normal digestive processes in the small intestine or by bacterial digestion in the large intestine. The molecule is too big to be absorbed across the intestinal wall to any appreciable extent. It cannot be metabolized and therefore produces no calories. In addition, P&G scientists were able to manipulate the fatty acid composition of Olestra to give it the thickness, cooking properties, and taste of natural fats and oils. Hence, it could substitute for any conventional oil to prepare fast foods, restaurant meals, or for that matter, foods cooked at home. Learning Together with FDA The possibility that Olestra might be eaten in amounts far greater than any other food additive explains the FDA's regulatory predicament. Food additives usually are consumed in tiny amounts but tested in animals at hundredfold higher levels. This method could not be used to find out whether Olestra induced diarrhea or depleted fat-soluble vitamins, because animals could not be forced to eat enough of it. P&G needed to develop different types of methods for evaluating safety, and the FDA needed to establish new regulatory standards for a product that could not be tested in routine ways. Over the years, P&G and FDA learned together how to approach these tasks. The food additive approach seemed especially attractive when, in 1984, the FDA tacitly permitted Kellogg to claim that its high-fiber cereals helped reduce the risk of cancer. The Kellogg claim led P&G to hope that the FDA would also allow health claims for Olestra, tacitly or otherwise. After three years of further studies, the company filed its food additive petition. It requested approval of Olestra as a substitute for up to 35% of the natural fats used in home cooking and up to 75% of the fats used for commercial purposes. Because the petition did not ask the FDA to approve use of Olestra for table spreads and ice cream, P&G considered the request a conservative first step. The FDA, however, viewed the vast scope of potential uses as raising safety issues that required further testing. Therefore, to expedite approval, P&G again changed strategies. This time it asked only for authorization to use Olestra in savory, salted and spiced, snacks. In support of this petition, P&G submitted 150 animal and human studies, and 150,000 pages of data related to the effects of Olestra on absorption and excretion of drugs, vitamins, carotenoids, plant precursors of vitamin A that have antioxidant properties, 
and minerals, as well as on hormone levels, intestinal function, and certain gastrointestinal diseases. Late in 1995, the FDA provided a summary of this information to a subcommittee of its Food Advisory Committee and to the Parent Committee itself. The FDA also gave these committees a detailed critical analysis of PNG's research prepared by the Center for Science in the Public Interest, CSPI. CSPI had been organizing opposition to Olestra since 1987 when it first challenged the safety of the product in response to P&G's food additive petition. Its 1995 analysis dealt with several potential effects of Olestra on health and intestinal function. CSPI's interpretation was that Olestra depleted carotenoids and fat-soluble vitamins and caused noticeable gastrointestinal disturbances. On that basis, and because Olestra appeared to be associated with precancerous liver lesions in animals, CSPI maintained that the FDA should deny approval. CSPI also criticized the design of P&G's studies, especially given that the few independent investigations confirmed some of the flaws. For example, studies sponsored by Unilever, a P&G competitor, reported that high doses of Olestra caused gastrointestinal problems in 15 to 30 percent of recipients, and that a dose of just 3 grams, less than the amount in an ounce of potato chips, reduced blood levels of fat-soluble vitamins and carotenes by significant amounts. Such findings suggested that Olestra might increase risks for heart disease, stroke, cancer, and cataracts. As it turns out, Olestra is so efficient at eliminating fat-soluble substances from the intestine that clinicians can use chips fried in Olestra to reduce symptoms of dioxin poisoning in patients with toxic levels of this chemical in their bodies. Despite such findings, and despite the 6,600 anecdotal complaints of gastrointestinal problems that had been filed with FDA by the time of the meeting, the Food Advisory Committee judged P&G's research sufficient and acceptable. Most members were not convinced that any serious harm would result from the losses of fat-soluble vitamins or carotenes. They also believed that the warning notice was sufficient to handle concerns about gastrointestinal distress. Thus, both FDA advisory committees recommended approval, although some members sharply dissented. On January 24, 1996, the FDA announced approval of Olestra for use in savory snacks, but with some provisos. P&G would need to formulate Olestra to meet certain specifications for composition and stiffness. Manufacturers of products containing Olestra would have to fortify them with fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K to compensate for potential losses. And they would also have to include a warning notice on the package label. Recognizing that P&G planned to conduct post-market surveys of consumer responses to Olestra, the FDA also announced that it would review the results of those surveys and any new data in 30 months and would reconsider the approval at that time. The 30-month trial period ended in June 1998, when the FDA asked the Food Advisory Committee to evaluate whether P&G's post-market studies had raised any significant public health concerns and whether any changes were needed in labeling requirements. When the committee voted to reaffirm its original approval, it enabled the FDA to conclude a matter that had demanded substantial attention from the agency for 27 years. P&G's Marketing Campaign Once the FDA had approved Olestra, P&G needed to sell it to the public. It did so under the brand name Olean. P&G's promotion of Olean products was unusual only in that the campaign was exceptionally comprehensive, visible, and expensive. P&G spent huge sums on media advertising, much of it suggesting that Olean was nothing more than calorie-free soybean oil. The company also employed more subtle forms of promotion, such as educating health professionals, and it used hardball tactics to discredit its critics. 
launching the products. P&G does not make potato chips or other savory snacks, but Frito-Lay, a division of PepsiCo, does. P&G sold exclusive rights to Frito-Lay to make Olestra chips in exchange for what was said to be an eight-figure investment in a new manufacturing plant. To launch the test marketing of the new products, P&G worked with numerous public relations people, some of them well-connected former advisors to President Clinton. P&G and Frito-Lay officials personally visited media outlets, and the companies distributed hundreds of thousands of free samples, recruited and trained dietitians, collected testimonials from satisfied customers, ran tour buses, hired cheerleaders, and did Christo-like wrappings of supermarkets in Olean banners. They distributed pamphlets to consumers, gave educational packets to junior high school and high school students, and donated videotapes. These activities were said to have generated gobs of free publicity and sales of 28 million servings by mid-1997. P&G's press materials boasted that enough fat had been saved to fill four railroad cars. Defending the Investment New products are expensive to launch and companies expect to invest substantial sums in advertising and promotion. P&G's investment in bringing Olestra to market, however, seemed unusually large. Although the amount can only be estimated, it appears to be at least $500 million. During the 1993 patent hearings, P&G officials reported expenditures of $200 million for Olestra research and development. Other sources reported estimates of 160 to 250 million dollars for the Olestra processing plant and 5 to 10 million dollars for the Ohio test marketing. The costs of the three other test markets were believed to be somewhat lower. In addition, Frito-Lay was reported to have spent 7.4 million dollars and P&G 22 million dollars on advertising for Olestra products just in the first quarter of 1998. To these costs must be added expenditures for the 700,000 acres of land used for growing soybeans and cotton to produce Olestra's fatty acids and costs of purchasing sugar raw materials. Such astronomical expenditures must be understood in context. In 1996, P&G earned $35.3 billion in revenues and spent $3.25 billion to advertise its full line of products, of which $30 million was spent just to advertise pre-Olestra Pringles potato chips. That same year, Americans bought 5.5 billion pounds of salty snacks worth $13 billion. Olestra chips would not have to capture a very large share of this market to recoup P&G's investment. Indeed, company officials predicted annual revenues of four to five hundred million dollars by 1999. If the FDA could be convinced to approve Olestra cooking oil, P&G also could enter the billion-dollar annual markets for fried snack and restaurant foods. Whether the company would achieve its financial goals seemed questionable, at least in the short term. Although more than 100 million bags of chips were reported sold from the February launch through July 1998, tracking data from one of the early test markets indicated that sales fell markedly as soon as the advertising blitz ended. And although P&G officials maintained that Olestra was on track to earn the $400 million that had been expected in the first year, other sources reported that sales had fallen from $41 million to $28 million per month from May to August 1998, meaning that Olestra was not turning out to be the second coming some people thought it would be. From March 1998 to March 1999, Frito-Lay's sales of Olestra chips totaled $260 million, far below expectations, a shortfall attributed to Olestra's image problem. As one business analyst put it, the consumer has spoken. 
It seemed like people had a negative perception of it right off the bat. When by July 2000 sales of Frito-Lay's Olestra chips had fallen another 30% or so, and P&G's post-market surveys showed little evidence of gastrointestinal effects, the companies argued that the label warning was misleading and was being misunderstood by consumers, and they petitioned the FDA to delete the warning label. Late in 2000, in a further effort to improve this market niche, P&G began test-marketing sandwich crackers made with Olestra in peanut butter, cheese, and veggie cream cheese varieties. Whether removing the warning statement would improve sales was also questionable. Olestra chips had been introduced at a time when people were eating fewer reduced-fat products and other snack foods were becoming more competitive. Consumers were disappointed that Olean chips tasted just like ordinary potato chips. I did my own taste comparison and thought they tasted about the same as other commercial chips, though I noted that they were priced a bit higher. My local supermarket shelved bags of Olestra chips intermingled with regular chips, and they were difficult to identify except by a small Olean in the lower right corner. People also were disappointed that the chips did not help them lose weight. Despite these discouraging observations and predictions of doom, P&G remained optimistic. Company officials noted that consumers have already enjoyed more than 1.5 billion servings, avoiding 140 billion calories and 35 million pounds of fat, and that reports of the demise of Olestra were greatly exaggerated. Co-opting Health Professionals P&G garnered support from nutrition and health professionals through efforts targeted at organizations, publications, and individuals. The company gave grants to organizations to develop educational materials and to hold conferences on Olestra and related topics. It sponsored focus groups and booths at annual meetings and paid publication costs for special issues of professional journals. For example, a P&G official sits on the board of the International Life Sciences Institute, which sponsored a conference funded in part by the company. Proceedings of the conference were published through the New York Academy of Sciences. P&G also is one of many corporate sponsors of professional publications that publish articles on Olestra, both pro and con, such as the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and the Journal of Nutrition. The company has supported scientists, educators, and practitioners through research grants, travel funds, honoraria, educational materials, samples, and meals. It mailed educational brochures and samples of Olestra chips to tens of thousands of physicians, nurses, and dietitians and sent its research summaries and articles to thousands more. P&G officials paid personal visits to professionals perceived as influential, and the company recruited dozens of paid consultants, among them two former secretaries of Health and Human Services, and many prominent researchers and clinicians. These people wrote articles, testified, or appeared in commercials supporting Alestra. Although recipients of corporate funding do not inevitably support corporate interests, such financial connections give the appearance of conflict of interest. Most people who accept P&G funds undoubtedly do so because they believe that Olestra is beneficial or that the arrangement is unlikely to influence their critical judgment. In my personal experience, it is virtually impossible for any nutritionist interested in the benefits and risks of Olestra to avoid some sort of financial relationship with P&G unless one systematically refuses all speaking invitations, travel reimbursements, honoraria, and meals from outside parties. I consider myself independent of P&G, Yet I have had a professional relationship with the company that dates back to 1988 when I spoke at a P&G-sponsored press luncheon announcing release of the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. Does Alestra Work? P&G's campaign to promote Alestra distracts attention from what should be the most critical question, 
Do Olean-branded foods help people reduce their fat intake and lose weight? Not unexpectedly, research studies funded by the company find healthful changes in dietary fat intake and serum cholesterol concentrations among consumers who choose to consume olestra-containing foods. For several reasons, such findings are unlikely to be reproduced across broad sections of the population. To begin with, Olestra addresses just the fat component of an overall dietary pattern. Its use in snacks might help some people reduce their intake of fat and calories, and perhaps their body weight and certain chronic disease risk factors, but its effects on absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and phytochemicals might interfere with the health benefits of fruits and vegetables. Furthermore, foods containing Olestra may not contain fat, but they do contain calories, and plenty of them. Olestra saves just one-third to one-half the calories of natural fat products. People who eat Olestra chips may believe that they can eat such foods with caloric impunity and compensate by eating more of them. One user of Olestra products told me, I love Olestra. It means I get to eat potato chips. The whole bag. And she was not talking about a one-ounce package. According to other studies sponsored by P&G, early adoption of Olestra products tracks with other indicators of good health habits. White ethnicity, higher education, lower fat intake. People who frequently eat chips and other savory snacks, however, generally have diets of rather poor quality. Given this situation, eating Olestra chips does not seem a particularly efficient way to improve anyone's overall diet. Experience with artificial sweeteners also suggests that Olestra is unlikely to have much effect on weight, or for that matter on overall fat intake. In 1970, not long after first introducing artificial sweeteners, manufacturers produced enough of them to replace the equivalent of 5.8 pounds of sugars per person per year. In 1991, the last year for which such figures were available, they produced enough to replace nearly 25 pounds of sugars per capita. From 1970 to 1991, however, the availability of caloric sugars in the food supply increased from 122 to 138 pounds per person per year, and it increased further to 154 pounds in 1997. Some individuals who use artificial sweeteners may reduce their sugar intake, but most do not. If Olestra indeed reduces inhibitions about eating salty snacks, or encourages deliberate misuse to induce laxative effects, as has been reported, people may well eat more of these products and increase their calorie intake. Given the uncertainties about Olestra's long-term effect on vitamin absorption, the lack of evidence for long-term benefits, the overabundance of food produced in the United States, and the pressing need to find ways to feed the world's growing population, P&G's Herculean efforts to develop and market Olestra might well be viewed as an astonishing waste of human, land, food, and economic resources. Whether these efforts will continue to reward stockholders remains to be determined. Techno Foods Implications In developing Olestra and other techno foods, manufacturers appeared to be responding to policy recommendations from government health officials and to be doing precisely what they were asked to do to improve the nation's health. In return, they demanded and won the ability to make health claims for their products. Health claims drive the design of functional foods. Manufacturers have a firm notion of the claims they would like to make for their products before they even start to develop them. Authorized health claims, and more recently structure function claims, have greatly stimulated development of products reduced or substituted in fat or sugar, and of products fortified with nutrients, fiber, or herbals and phytochemicals. P&G's $500 million investment in Olestra research and development and the expected returns on that investment give some indication of what is at stake in today's functional foods marketplace. Some of these foods indeed may be beneficial, 
especially to the already health-conscious higher-income consumers most likely to purchase them. Such people already follow recommended health practices and can easily adopt another. Fortification of the food supply certainly raises the overall consumption levels of the nutrients used and improves the nutritional status of people with low intakes of those nutrients. Fiber and soy-supplemented foods should help reduce blood cholesterol levels among people who eat enough of them and who follow low-fat diets. Stanol and sterol-supplemented margarines also should help lower blood cholesterol levels when they replace other fats in already healthful diets, as should the replacement of high-fat snack foods with those lower in fat or made with olestra. But no functional foods can ever replace the full range of nutrients and phytochemicals present in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, nor can they overcome the detrimental effects of diets that are not already healthful. Although it makes sense to foster the development, marketing, and consumption of products that really do provide health benefits, it makes no sense whatsoever to flood the market with exaggerated claims and products of dubious benefit. Because messages to eat less fat and sugar are so well recognized by the public, potato chips, sugared cereals, and candies can appear to be healthful just because they are low in fat or contain added vitamins or minerals. Low-fat cookies, olestra-fried chips, zinc-fortified breakfast cereals, vitamin-supplemented candies, and stanol-supplemented margarines may lull people into a false sense of dietary security. Fortified junk foods are still junk. Fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, and low-fat milk and yogurt are packed with nutrients or phytochemicals. Chips, candy bars, and cookies, even if they're fat-free, low-salt, and contain no preservatives, can't take the place of foods that come with no label, no advertising, and no gimmicks. From the standpoint of nutrition, techno-foods simply are not necessary. From the standpoint of food traditions, they may not be desirable. The food marketplace already is glutted with an enormous overabundance of calories and products, and it is not difficult to select a health-promoting diet from this supply at quite low cost. The techno-food approach misses the point that the best health outcomes are associated with dietary patterns that follow recommendations, not just eating or avoiding one or another single food. What is particularly disturbing about functional foods is how they change the way people think about dietary patterns. They suggest that foods are medicines, and they convert the pleasures of eating into the perils of drug-taking. My esteemed colleague Joan Gusso, who has thought long and deeply about such matters, observes that if we view foods simply as containers of nutrients or curative substances, we encourage manufacturers to think of more ways to invent more new products to meet some perceived health need. She argues that foods should be appreciated for the richness and complexity of their taste and cultural context, as well as for their nutritional aspects. She concludes, Eating healthfully is neither complicated, nor time-consuming, nor punishing, and we don't need any more new products to do it. As this discussion has demonstrated, the primary beneficiaries of techno-foods are most likely to be the companies that make them. The degree of benefit to the public is much less certain, and the potential for harm, in more frequent and blatant health claims, more products claiming special health benefits, products that actually do damage, increased pressure to eat more, and greater public confusion about diet and health, is not insignificant and should concern all of us. Conclusion The Politics of Food Choice We have seen how the food industry uses lobbying, lawsuits, financial contributions, public relations, advertising, partnerships and alliances, philanthropy, threats, and biased information to convince Congress, federal agencies, nutrition and health professionals, and the public, that the science relating diet to health is so confusing that they need not worry about diets. When it comes to diets, anything goes. 
Representatives of food companies and their trade associations repeatedly make the following claims. The keys to healthful diets are balance, variety, and moderation, especially when their products are included. All foods can be part of healthful diets, especially theirs. There is no such thing as a good or a bad food, except when their products are considered good. Dietary advice changes so often that we need not follow it, unless it favors their products. Research on diet and health is so uncertain that it is meaningless, except when it supports the health benefits of their products. Only a small percentage of the population would benefit from following population-based dietary advice if that advice suggests restrictions on intake of their products. Diets are a matter of personal responsibility and freedom of choice, especially the freedom to choose their products. Advocacy for more healthful food choices is irrational if it suggests eating less of their products. Government intervention in dietary choice is unnecessary, undesirable, and incompatible with democratic institutions, unless it protects and promotes their products. Dr. Rona Applebaum of the National Food Processors Association, for example, succinctly expresses such views when she says that diets should conform to the three principles of sound nutritional advice, balance, variety, and moderation and that societal measures to support more healthful food choices are unnecessary. Changing the environment of food choices possible, she maintains, only if the federal government in the role of Big Brother mandates what foods can or cannot be produced, which is not the role of government in a free market economy. Controlling, limiting, and outright banning of products deemed unfit does not work and history attests to the failure of such extremist measures. Food consumption is not supply-driven, it is demand-driven, and consumers are in the driver's seat. You cannot force people to comply with the dietary guidelines, and it is wrong to try. It is an unworkable totalitarian approach that brings with it all the evils associated with such a philosophy. With such statements... Food industry officials appeal to emotion, in this case fears of totalitarianism, to argue against something that no nutritionist, private or governmental, advocates. Nutritionists are simply trying to educate the public that some foods are better for health than others. The food industry fiercely opposes this idea and uses its substantial resources, political skills and emotional appeals to discourage attempts to introduce eat less messages into public discussion of dietary issues and instead to encourage people to eat more. These tactics on the part of food companies are in one sense a routine part of doing business. They are no different from those used by other large commercial interests, such as drug companies or, as we shall see, tobacco companies. But sellers of food products do not attract the same kind of attention as purveyors of drugs or tobacco. They should, not only because of the health consequences of dietary choices, but also because of the ethical issues raised by industry marketing practices. Food marketing raises ethical dilemmas, but so does attempting to regulate or change people's food choices, deciding how government should protect health within the context of a free market economy determining what kinds of policy changes might support more healthful food choices, and identifying the role of individual responsibility in making such choices. This concluding chapter explores such dilemmas. The Environment of Food Choice We are fortunate to live in a free market economy that gives us an abundant, indeed an overabundant, food supply at low cost. What we choose to make of this supply is, of course, a matter of personal responsibility, as food company officials are quick to argue. But we do not make food choices in a vacuum. We select diets in a marketing environment in which billions of dollars are spent to convince us that nutrition advice is so confusing and eating healthfully so impossibly difficult that there is no point in bothering to eat less of one or another food product or category. We may believe that we make informed decisions about food choice, but we cannot do so 
if we are oblivious of the ways food companies influence our choices. Most of us, if we choose to do so, can recognize how food companies spend money on advertising, but it is far more difficult to know about the industry's behind-the-scenes efforts in Congress, federal agencies, courts, universities, and professional organizations to make diets seem a matter of personal choice rather than of deliberate manipulation. The emphasis on individual choice serves the interests of the food industry for one critical reason. If diet is a matter of individual free will, then the only appropriate remedy for poor diets is education, and nutritionists should be off teaching people to take personal responsibility for their own diet and health, not how to institute societal changes that might make it easier for everyone to do so. That suggestions to change the social environment of food choice are threatening to industry is evident from the vehemence with which trade associations and the business press attack advice to restrict intake of one or another food group, to get junk food out of schools, to label foods more explicitly, or to tax sales of foods to generate funds for nutrition education. Business commentators equate such approaches with nothing less than fascism. If President Bill Clinton really wants ideas for a healthy eating crusade, he must surely look to the only political regime that thoroughly made them part of national policy, Nazi Germany. They could not be more sarcastic about societal approaches to dietary change. This being America, of course, ordering Big E fries instead of the salad bar can't possibly be our own fault. If all this sounds a bit preposterous, it only means you have an underdeveloped sense of victimhood. The parallels between big tobacco and big fat are too striking to be overlooked. Come on, America, get off that couch and sue. Sarcasm aside, if the business press finds parallels between the tobacco and food industries, it is because the parallels are impossible to avoid. Cigarette companies famously argue that smoking is a matter of individual choice and that it is wrong for government to interfere unduly in the private lives of citizens. They use science to sow confusion about the harm that cigarettes can cause. They set the standard in use of public relations, advertising, philanthropy, experts, political funding, alliances, lobbying, intimidation, and lawsuits to protect their sales. In efforts to expand markets, they promote cigarette smoking to children and adolescents, to minorities, women, and the poor, and to people in countries throughout the world, developing as well as industrialized. The similarities between the actions of cigarette companies and food companies are no coincidence. As explained in the introduction, cigarette companies sometimes owned food companies. No matter who owns them, Food companies lobby government and agencies, and they become financially enmeshed with experts on nutrition and health. Although the food industry frames such tactics as promoting individual liberty and free will, its true objective is, not surprisingly, trade and unrestricted profit. With respect to cigarettes, most Americans by now are thoroughly aware of the marketing practices of tobacco companies. We learned about them through decades of anti-smoking campaigns. These campaigns succeeded in getting warning labels on cigarette packages, getting smoking restricted areas in businesses and on airplanes, and even inspiring an attempt by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to regulate tobacco as a drug. The parallel practices of food companies, however, have elicited nowhere near this level of protest. The principal reasons for this difference must surely lie in the complexity of the messages about foods and their health effects. Although cigarettes and diet contribute to comparable levels of illness and death across the population, cigarettes constitute a single entity in contrast to a food system that currently supplies 320,000 food products. No nutritionist could ever suggest that eating an occasional candy bar or bag of potato chips might cause disease. It truly is the overall dietary pattern that counts, and it counts over a lifetime. Unlike the straightforward don't smoke advice, the dietary message can never be don't eat. 
Instead, it has to be the more complicated and ambiguous eat this instead of that, eat this more often than that, and the overall prescription eat less. The actions of food companies greatly add to the confusion and in some ways create it. Companies are in business to make money. That is their job. For stockholders, it is irresponsible and illegal for companies to make decisions that will not lead to increased profits. If companies offer foods of minimal nutritional value and people buy them, companies will continue to make and market them. If fat, sugar, and salt help to sell products, companies will market top-of-the-pyramid products in the name of freedom of choice. If nutrition, added vitamins, reduced fat, helps to sell products, the companies will use nutrition as a marketing tool. If the market is not expanding, they will increase the range of their marketing targets to children, urban minorities, and people in developing countries, whether or not the products displace more nutritious foods in the diet or add unnecessary calories. These actions also parallel the tactics of tobacco companies. And in the same way that cigarette companies' promotion of smoking raises ethical issues, so does the food industry's promotion of minimally nutritious products and of overeating in general. The Ethics of Food Choice Ethical issues arise whenever actions that benefit one group harm another. Food choices have economic, political, social, and environmental consequences that place improvements to the health of individuals or populations in conflict with other considerations. Underlying the notion of food ethics is the assumption that following dietary guidelines improves health and well-being. If ethics is viewed as a matter of good conduct versus bad, then choosing a healthful diet and advising people to do so would seem to be virtuous actions. As we have seen, food industry representatives question this assumption when they say that dietary guidelines apply only to a small percentage of the population, or claim that they do more harm than good by causing unnecessary deprivation and anxiety. I have heard ethicists call such problems mass communication risks, meaning in this case that education about nutrition out of its dietary context makes people misinterpret advice, whether the advice comes from government, academics, or industry. Beyond concerns about whether it is appropriate for anyone to tell anyone else what to eat in the name of health, the principal ethical issues related to dietary practices involve the implications of advice to eat less for food producers and the food service industry. Some years ago, the nutrition educators Joan Gusso and Kate Clancy began to ask whether it is ethical for food companies to market large numbers of resource-intensive, high-calorie, low-nutrient food products to people who neither need nor can afford them, and in the case of children, do not understand the difference between advertising and education. They questioned the ethical implications of promoting a seasonless, regionless diet in which an average food travels thousands of miles before it is eaten, a practice that wastes natural resources, requires extensive use of pesticides, energy-intensive fertilizers, antibiotics, and hormones, and causes people in developing countries to produce food for export rather than for themselves. In their view, the overriding ethical dilemma associated with dietary guidelines is the conflict between following the advice and eating more plant foods, but less meat, dairy, and processed foods, and the effects of doing so on food producers. These economic realities are a problem worth worrying over. We all need to be concerned, if people start to eat less beef and sugar and Pringles, about the cattle growers, the cane raisers, and the Pringle makers. But we must also recognize that consumers need help choosing foods, and there is no way we can help them select better diets without causing economic disruption to some sectors of the food industry. That virtuous dietary choices can result in economic harm to food producers is evident from U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, studies. 
USDA economists estimate that eating more fruit and vegetables and fewer foods of animal origin would upset the existing volume, mix, production, and marketing of agricultural commodities and would require large adjustments in international food trade, non-food uses of basic commodities, and food prices. Some agricultural sectors, fruits, vegetables, would benefit if people followed dietary guidelines, but others, beef, corn, sugar, would suffer. What might seem a virtue to some people might seem a vice to others, hence ethical and policy dilemmas. Ethical or not, a message to eat less meat, dairy, and processed foods is not going to be popular among the producers of such foods. It will have only limited popularity with producers of fruits and vegetables because their scale of production is limited and they cannot easily add value to their products. The message will not be popular with cattle ranchers, meat packers, dairy producers, or milk bottlers, oil seed growers, processors, or transporters, grain producers, most grain is used to feed cattle, makers of soft drinks, candy bars, and snack foods, owners of fast food outlets and franchise restaurants, media corporations and advertising agencies, manufacturers and marketers of television sets and computers, where advertising takes place, and eventually drug and health care industries likely to lose business if people stay healthier longer. The range of economic sectors that would be affected if people changed their diets, avoided obesity, and prevented chronic diseases surely rivals the range of industries that would be affected if people stopped smoking cigarettes. Perhaps for this reason, USDA officials believe that really encouraging people to follow dietary guidelines would be so expensive and disruptive to the agricultural economy as to create impossible political barriers. Rather than accepting the challenge and organizing a concerted national campaign to encourage more healthful eating patterns, they propose a more politically expedient solution. The industry should work to improve the food supply through nutrient fortification and the development of functional foods with added nutritional value. Such proposals raise ethical dilemmas of their own. These foods are not necessarily healthier, and they encourage people to eat more, not less. Taking Action Improving Public and Corporate Policies Given the ethical and political implications just discussed, we must now ask two questions. What should health professionals and concerned citizens do to improve the social and political environment in which people make food choices? And how can we be sure that the actions we take are both responsible and effective? Once again, the parallel with tobacco is instructive. In the 30 years or so since publication of the Surgeon General's first report on smoking and health, cigarettes have become socially unacceptable, on health grounds, among many groups and in many locations. Many of the lessons learned from the tobacco wars apply just as well to food, especially the lesson that the industry will relentlessly counter even the slightest suggestion to use less of its products. That actions typical of anti-smoking campaigns are only rarely applied to nutrition issues is a tribute to how well the food industry has sown confusion about the research linking diet to health, about advice based on that research, and about dietary choices based on that advice. The result is the widely held idea that eat less need not apply to categories of foods, to specific food products, or to food in general. In this regard also, we have much to learn from the tobacco wars. Successful anti-smoking campaigns are based on four elements. A firm research base, a clear message, well-defined targets for intervention, and strategies that address the societal environment as well as the education of individual smokers. The research basis of anti-smoking messages is firmly established. Cigarettes cause lung cancer. The message is simple don't smoke. The targets are well-defined. Anti-smoking efforts focus not only on individuals who smoke, but also on the companies that produce cigarettes. 
The strategies include education but also encompass environmental measures, such as age thresholds for buying cigarettes, cigarette taxes, and bans on smoking in airplanes, restaurants, and workplaces. Could the four principal elements of anti-smoking campaign strategies, research, message, target, and tactics, be applied to dietary change? With regard to research, the evidence for the health benefits of hierarchical dietary patterns that emphasize fruits, vegetables, and grains is strong, consistent, and associated with prevention of as much illness as cessation of smoking. The message to follow pyramid-like dietary patterns is more complicated than don't smoke, but not impossible to understand. Just as don't smoke applies to everyone, so does the dietary message. Everyone benefits from following a dietary pattern that contributes to prevention of so many diseases. Perhaps the most important lesson of all concerns tactics. Anti-smoking campaigns succeeded when they began to focus on environmental issues rather than on the education of individuals. If we want to encourage people to eat better diets, we need to target societal means to counter food industry lobbying and marketing practices as well as the education of individuals. Achieving a more equitable balance necessarily starts with Congress, and therefore with the reform of laws governing campaign contributions and lobbying. History, however, suggests little basis for optimism that such reforms can occur soon without much more forceful advocacy of consumer perspectives. A related reform would be to erect a higher and stronger firewall between Congress and regulatory agencies. This kind of reform might benefit industry as well as the public, because it would allow companies to compete from the same starting point. To achieve this firewall, Congress would need to reconsider the provisions of laws affecting FDA functions, especially the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, Deshaies, and the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, FDAMA, that so handicap the agency's ability to regulate food and supplement supply. Congress needs to allocate more funding for the agency's regulatory missions, not less, as has been its recent practice. In strengthening the FDA, Congress will need to address the long-standing historical anomaly that its appropriations for the FDA are negotiated through congressional agriculture, not health, committees. This anomaly derives from the original assignment of the FDA to the USDA in 1906. The FDA was transferred to a health agency, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, in 1953, and has been a unit of the Department of Health and Human Services since that department's creation in 1979. Nevertheless, congressional decisions about which of the FDA's functions are funded and at what level, depend more on how they might affect agriculture than on how they might affect the health of Americans. To select just one example, public health might be better served if the FDA could sponsor research by independent investigators to further its regulatory decisions, yet congressional agriculture committees consistently deny requests for such funding. The regulatory agencies themselves could also help create a more independent environment for their work. They could institute greater restrictions on the ability of officials to take jobs with industry and could insist on full disclosure of conflicts of interest by members of advisory committees. The FDA and USDA could be more sensitive to the need to avoid even the appearance of working hand-in-glove with the industries they regulate. As we have seen, the USDA's conflicting missions to promote agribusiness and to advise the public about diet and health cause no end of trouble. Such problems are unlikely to be resolved until the USDA's education functions are transferred to an agency less intimately tied to industry interests. Advocates have proposed instituting a single food agency as a way to settle coordination conflicts among the various federal agencies that deal with food safety, and nutrition education might well flourish in such a venue. In this instance, also, history suggests that it will be politically inexpedient, if not downright impossible, 
to accomplish such restructuring. More realistic are shorter-term actions that community and state governments could take to help people make more healthful dietary choices. The current epidemic of obesity is reason enough to demand action, and the associated health care costs are sufficient grounds for believing that at least some actions might be politically feasible. Today, numerous government policies support the present food system. These policies could be revised to promote more healthful diets rather than the economic interests of the food industry. Efforts to promote better food choices begin with education. Simply put, an educated public is a healthier public. At issue is how to raise the dietary literacy of the general public. Although government agencies create dietary guidelines and food guides, they, in effect, delegate the responsibility for promoting this advice to industry. Industry, as we have seen, is unlikely to promote any message to eat less. Therefore, the fact that people do not follow dietary advice cannot be considered evidence that this advice, or nutrition education in general, is ineffective. For reasons of politics as well as finances, the government is unlikely to fund a nationwide campaign to educate people to eat less. Federal agencies do not even support the least controversial of nutrition education campaigns, eat more fruit and vegetables, with anything approaching an adequate budget. The annual budget for the education component of the National Cancer Institute's Five-A-Day Partnership with Industry to promote consumption of five servings of fruits and vegetables each day is less than the amount spent to advertise a single candy bar or soft drink and by a factor of 50 to 100. Despite demonstrations that advertising can be extraordinarily effective in promoting desirable dietary changes, such as a switch from whole to lower fat milk, and at a cost of less than one dollar for every person reached, no government agency can possibly spend that kind of money to reach everyone in the population without a substantial change in tax allocations. USDA economists tell us that rising incomes, time constraints, and low food prices outweigh nutrition education as factors influencing dietary choices, and that as incomes rise, people eat more, become less active, and gain weight. As incomes rise further, however, health goals become more important. This last observation suggests that a burgeoning economy creates a stronger base of advocacy for dietary change. One place to begin is with children. If the roots of obesity are in childhood, then marketing of foods to children deserves substantial public opposition. Banning commercials for foods of minimal nutritional value from children's television programs and from schools and preventing such foods from replacing more nutritious foods in school lunches are actions ripe for advocacy, school by school, district by district, state by state. Tax and price policies are another option. Sales of soft drinks, candy, chewing gum, and snack foods already are taxed in at least 18 states and one major city, and these taxes generate more than $1 billion annually. Some advocates propose that state and local governments tax such products at levels too small to affect sales, less than a penny per soda, for example, and use the accumulated funds to support health promotion campaigns. Price changes clearly influence buying decisions and can be manipulated to improve dietary intake. For example, reducing the prices of low-fat snacks in vending machines and of fruits and vegetables in school cafeterias, increases sales of these items. The prices of fruits and vegetables also could be subsidized to compensate in part for the low economic added value of these foods, just as is already done through price supports for dairy foods and sugar. These and other fiscal measures to fund health promotion programs are certain to encounter opposition, and USDA officials characterize such proposals as unrealistic and unfriendly to consumers. Nevertheless, judging from experience with the states that have passed such taxes, it appears that the public is willing to vote for them, especially if they are not unduly burdensome 
and are targeted to desirable social goals such as health promotion. Given the environment in which food corporations operate, it is worth considering how companies might continue to please stockholders yet market their products more ethically. As a starting point, companies could stop attacking and undermining regulatory agencies. They could stop marketing directly to children. They could stop touting misleading health benefits for their products, invoking individuality and free will and complaining about Big Brother government. They could bring reality in line with their rhetoric. If food companies really do have the public interest at heart, they could act accordingly. Charles Pillar, the technology columnist for the Los Angeles Times, urges companies to provide explicit help to the communities in which they operate and from which they receive substantial subsidies by committing 1% of annual profits to support local public schools and not just by giving them computers. This excellent idea is well worth the attention of officials concerned about the quality of their company's future workforce, if nothing else. In considering ways to improve the environment of food choice, we need to examine the role of health experts. In this context, let me speak directly to my professional colleagues. We nutritionists are not trained to be extremists or revolutionaries, and few of us would want to turn nutrition into a moral issue. Most of us think that food is delightful to eat, as well as to study, and that it should be enjoyed for the pleasures it gives, as well as for its health benefits. Even those of us who are concerned about the practices of food companies are not trying to shut down the food industry. Foods, after all, are not cigarettes. Nevertheless, it is difficult to avoid noticing that food companies work just like tobacco companies to sell their products. In forging alliances with food companies, we lose sight of this resemblance and of the influence of food marketing practices on public health. Many of us find it easier to take the innocuous balance variety moderation approach to dietary advice than to face the consequences of saying choose this over that or just eat less. On the basis of the examples given in this book, it seems difficult, if not impossible, for food and nutrition professionals to maintain independence or to be perceived as independent when we enter into partnerships and alliances with food companies. We may view alliances with industry as a logical way to reach the public with dietary messages or to fund our research, but such alliances inevitably raise questions of conflict of interest. All of us who are educators, practitioners, or researchers, as well as the professional societies that represent us, need to be better aware of the potential compromises inherent in accepting industry funding and to think about how we might take precautions to maintain our independence and integrity. If it is any consolation, we are not alone in needing to worry about such concerns. In the comparatively benign context of corporate sponsorship of science museum exhibits, for example, the eminent scientist Stephen Jay Gould explains that he is neither an idealist nor a Luddite in this matter. I just feel that the world of commerce and the world of intellect, by their intrinsic natures, must pursue different values and priorities. The commercial world looms so much larger than our domain that we can only be engulfed and destroyed if we make a devil's bargain of fusion for short-term gain. If we are going to make real progress in helping the public improve diet and health, we are going to have to face the political issues head-on, say what we really mean, and be willing to take the consequences of substantial opposition from many sectors of society. At stake are credibility, integrity, and ethics. One suggestion about how to do this comes from Sir Joseph Rotblat, the 1995 Nobel Laureate for Peace. He thinks that all scientists should take an ethics oath that includes this precept, among others. Throughout my career, I will consider the ethical implications of my work before I take action. This seems like a reasonable first step. Taking Action Voting with Forks 
I have argued that one of the most important lessons of anti-smoking campaigns is that efforts to improve eating habits must be environmental as well as personal, societal as well as individual. A focus on societal determinants does not in any way deny the importance of individual responsibility for food choices. Indeed, there is much that people can do to deal with and counter the lobbying, marketing, and public relations practices of the food industry. Our overabundant food system, a result as well as a cause of our flourishing economy, gives most of us the opportunity to make a political statement every time we eat and to make a difference. For example, buying locally produced organically grown food not only improves the taste and nutritional quality of the diet, if for no other reason than that the foods have not traveled so far or been stored so long, but also supports local farmers, promotes the viability of rural communities, and creates greater diversity in agricultural production. In the early 1990s, Old Ways Preservation and Exchange Trust, a Boston-based group then devoted to incorporating traditional foodways into current dietary choices, recognized the political implications of food choice when it urged chefs and restaurateurs to forge alliances with local food producers and vote with your fork. The value of such alliances is vividly illustrated by the purchasing practices of a small 65-seat vegan restaurant, Angelica's Kitchen, in New York City's East Village neighborhood. Among many other products, the restaurant buys 830 pounds of parsley, 2,100 pounds of greens, collards, kale, 3,400 pounds of squash, and 7,800 pounds of carrots every month, all of it organically grown and much of it from local suppliers. Another example, the celebrity chef Eberhard Müller and the food consultant Paulette Satter run an organic farm on Long Island that produces 3,000 pounds of organic lettuce every week while the season lasts. They distribute the farm's produce to more than 50 New York restaurants. Such alliances between restaurant owners, chefs, cooks, and farmers hold the promise of economic viability for everyone concerned. In his book, The McDonaldization of Society, George Ritzer advocates subverting the process by making what he calls personal, irrational choices. Never buy artificial, processed food products. Buy organic Avert your eyes during television commercials, and don't take children to fast food restaurants. Michael Jacobson and Lori Ann Mazur argue for downsizing commercialism to a more appropriate role in society. Their advice, pay attention, count advertisements, declare yourself a personal ad-free zone, don't wear corporate logos, boycott products, turn off the television, Get television commercials and soft drinks out of schools and teach critical media skills so everyone can tell the difference between advertisements and program content. The manifesto of the international slow food movement, its logo is a snail, says, Our defense should begin at the table with slow food. Let us rediscover the flavors and savors of regional cooking and banish the degrading effects of fast food. Adopting such actions is one way to apply ethical principles, but the higher cost and inconvenience of doing so are certain to preclude those choices for many, if not most, people. Unless we are willing to pay more for food, relinquish out-of-season produce, and rarely buy anything that comes in a package or is advertised on television, we support the current food system every time we eat a meal. That is why voting with our forks must extend beyond the food choices of individuals to larger political arenas. Countless community, state, and national organizations deal with food issues, and it is not difficult to find one to suit any political viewpoint or taste. As has been demonstrated by the support for creating federal standards for organic food, such groups can join together quickly and effectively when an issue of mutual interest emerges. 
This ability to exercise democratic power holds much hope for achieving a more equitable balance of interests in matters pertaining to food and health. Afterward, Food Politics, Five Years Later and Beyond The principal theme of food politics is that food choices are political as well as personal. That notion, perhaps surprising in 2002, is now well recognized. Then, personal responsibility was assumed to be the primary determinant of food choice. Today, it is widely accepted that food marketing influences food choices and that our Eat More Food Environment, one that promotes food that is highly varied, ubiquitous, convenient, close at hand, inexpensive, presented in large portions, and eaten frequently, encourages mindless consumption of more calories than are needed or noticed. Also increasingly recognized are the contradictory results of this environment. On one hand, overweight has become normal among adults and children. In all but the poorest or war-torn countries of the world, increasing proportions of the population are overweight. Although social discrimination continues to pose difficult challenges for overweight individuals, the business community has adapted to their growing numbers by increasing the size of items such as clothing, cup holders in automobiles, seats on buses, seat belts, aprons, life jackets, school desks, children's car seats, and coffins. As one index of the normalization of the health consequences of obesity, Hospitals have had to acquire larger scales, beds, wheelchairs, and examination tables. On the other hand, we are witnessing the development of an international movement to reverse obesity trends and to promote more healthful diet and activity patterns, especially among children. This movement is expressed most forcefully in demands for restrictions on food marketing to children and for legal and legislative actions to ensure such restrictions, particularly in schools. But before reviewing key events in that movement and the food industry's response to them, let's take a look at the way U.S. dietary guidance policies have responded to the obesity challenge. The 2005 Dietary Guidelines and Pyramid As Food Politics Explains, Government policies to prevent obesity should emphasize eat less, move more, as well as actions that make it easier to do so. But such policies encounter opposition from food companies under pressure to increase sales in an overabundant food economy. Ironically, such policies also run counter to current trends in the field of nutrition. Today, the nutrition profession increasingly focuses on the complexity of human dietary requirements and on the individualization of dietary advice. The current interest in nutrigenomics demonstrates this focus. Nutrigenomics aims to identify the unique genetic constitution of individuals so as to design diets and food products, nutraceuticals and technofoods, to meet personal, genetically determined needs. Current trends in nutrition science and food technology emphasize the complexity of dietary patterns, not common elements. Individual dietary advice, not public health recommendations that apply to most people. Personal responsibility and food choice, not environmental influences. Food equivalency, all foods are just fine. Not that some foods really are better for health than others. These trends and their interaction with politics help explain the 2005 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. In contrast to previous versions, these guidelines were required to be science-based, a phrase that always signals politics in action. To explain... Previous committees preparing dietary guidelines were instructed to review existing research and to give the public the best advice possible based on that research. The 2005 committee, however, was instructed to hold the guidelines to a higher scientific standard. This sounds fine in theory, but in practice it required the committee to construct guidelines based on the dietary reference intakes, DRIs, and to be thoroughly supported by research studies in effect, this meant that the guidelines became the second step 
in a three-step process involving the development of DRIs, Standards for Nutrient Intake Based on Extensive Scientific Review, published by the Institute of Medicine from 1997 to 2005, for use by nutrition professionals. Dietary Guidelines, Policy Statements Based on the DRIs Produced Jointly by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, and Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, in 2005, for use by policymakers and nutrition professionals. My Pyramid Food Guide Based on the Dietary Guidelines Produced by the USDA in 2005, for use by the general public. Each of these steps reflects trends toward complexity and individualization. In 1989, for example, the 10th edition of the Recommended Dietary Allowances, now part of the DRIs, was a single volume of just under 300 pages. The new DRIs comprise six volumes ranging from 432 to 1,331 pages each, a summary volume of 543 pages published in 2006, three short books explaining how DRIs apply to dietary assessment, 2000, Dietary Planning, 2003, and Food Labeling, 2003, and a 279-page summary volume on further research needs, 2006. The 2005 Dietary Guidelines Recall that the first four Dietary Guideline editions, 1980 to 1995, contained just seven precepts. The fifth, 2000, contained 10. But the complex and individualized science-based 2005 version contains 41 recommendations, 23 for the general public and 18 for special population groups such as children or the elderly, along with two diet plans based on 11 food groups for individuals consuming diets at 12 different calorie levels. Complexity confuses the public, and individualization implies that dietary advice should focus on personal dietary choices, not on how to cope with an eat-more food environment. Nutrition scientists maintain, quite correctly, that science is complex, individualization makes sense for advising people about their own diets, and the DRIs and dietary guidelines are meant as tools for professionals, not the general public. But because food guides, which are intended for the public, are based on the guidelines, it is worth asking whether politics had anything to do with this sharp departure from the previous versions. Of course it did. In 2003, the Center for Science in the Public Interest, CSPI, charged that seven of the 13 scientists nominated to the joint USDA-DHHS Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee consulted for or accepted research funds from food companies or trade associations with vested interests in their recommendations. One result? Key advice about weight management in the 2005 guidelines is mild and uncontroversial. Balance calories from foods and beverages with calories expended. And make small decreases in food and beverage calories and increase physical activity. One sentence, not a recommendation, buried in the long text, explains that the healthiest way to reduce calorie intake is to reduce one's intake of added sugars, fats, and alcohol. Politics helps explain why recommendations about dairy foods and sugars proved especially contentious. The Dairy Recommendation You might think that because whole milk, cheese, and butter together account for 6% of the calories in American diets, dietary guidelines might suggest eating less of high-fat dairy foods. Instead, they recommend an increase in the number of daily servings of milk or equivalent milk products from 2 to 3. Why? To meet the DRI for potassium, of all things. The science-based potassium DRI was set at twice the level of the 1989 RDA to compensate for the effects on blood pressure of the high sodium content of typical American diets. Dairy foods contribute 18% of the potassium in U.S. diets, 
so consuming more of them should increase potassium intake. But dairy foods also contribute 33% of the sodium in U.S. diets. So recommending dairy foods rather than vegetables, fruits, and grains, which are also high in potassium but much lower in sodium, seems like an odd choice. The increase is also puzzling in light of the high saturated fat content of dairy foods, their lactose content, difficult for some people to digest, the lack of evidence that dairy foods help prevent osteoporosis, and various other unsettled questions about their role in chronic diseases well known to DRI committees. An investigative report by the Wall Street Journal identified the politics behind this recommendation as a major victory for the $50 billion U.S. dairy industry. It attributed the 50% increase in recommended dairy servings to skillful lobbying based on research funded by the National Dairy Council, as well as to the financial ties of several members of the advisory committee to dairy trade groups. The Dairy Council works hard to promote dairy products as necessary aids to weight maintenance, as explained on its website. Question. What does the science say about dairy's role in weight loss? Answer. Research indicates that dairy foods have a positive effect on weight loss. In fact, research shows including three daily servings of milk, cheese, or yogurt as part of a reduced-calorie weight loss plan can help people lose more weight by burning more fat than just by cutting calories alone. How is this possible? The Dairy Council unhelpfully explains, While more research is needed to fully understand the dairy and weight loss connection, the unique nutrient package in dairy may be a key contributor to dairy's superior effect. Whether this eat more strategy will be more effective for weight loss than for dairy sales remains to be seen. The Sugar Recommendation the 1980 and 1985 dietary guidelines for sugar required only four words. Avoid too much sugar. Although the 2005 committee reviewed the growing body of research, linking habitual consumption of sugary foods and drinks with obesity in adults and children, the guidelines sugar recommendation is buried in a chapter on carbohydrates and requires 27 words. Choose and prepare foods and beverages with little added sugars or caloric sweeteners such as amounts suggested by the USDA Food Guide and the DASH Eating Plan. DASH takes five more words to explain. Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension The downplaying of advice to eat less sugar may have been due to committee members' ties to sugar groups, but was certainly due to politics, and to international politics at that. Because science provides circumstantial but not definitive evidence for an association between sugar intake, obesity, and other health problems, the science-based DRIs allow up to 25% of daily calories from added sugars, an upper limit cheerfully interpreted by sugar trade associations as a recommendation. In the early 2000s, the World Health Organization, WHO, began development of a global strategy to reduce risk factors for chronic disease, obesity among them. In 2003, it published a research report that advised restricting intake of free, added, sugars to 10% or less of daily calories. Although this percentage was similar to that embedded in the USDA's 1992 pyramid, 7 to 13 percent of calories, depending on total intake, sugar industry groups strenuously objected, enlisted senators from sugar-growing states to pressure the DHHS secretary to withdraw funding from WHO, and induced the DHHS chief counsel to send a critique of the report to WHO that had essentially been written by industry lobbyists. When released in 2004, WHO's Global Strategy on Diet, Physical Activity, and Health omitted any mention of the background report or the 10% sugar recommendation. Under these circumstances, the dietary guidelines, sponsored as they are by DHHS, could hardly say eat less sugar, sensible as that advice may be. The 2005 My Pyramid Food Guide Although influenced by politics, 
The process for developing the dietary guidelines was transparent. Transcripts of committee meetings and draft reports appeared promptly on the Internet. In contrast, the process used by the USDA to replace its 1992 pyramid was highly secret. It remains a mystery how the USDA came up with a food guide that illustrates physical activity but is completely devoid of food. According to the USDA, the key messages are meant to be physical activity, variety, proportionality, meaning amount, not hierarchy in food choice, moderation, gradual improvement, and personalization. Color and bandwidths denote food groups and serving numbers, but the only way to know this is to log on to a computer. Users must go to www.mypyramid.gov and type in gender, age, and activity level to obtain a personalized dietary plan at one of 12 calorie levels. People who explore the site, and millions have, will find diet plans notable for the large amounts of food recommended and the lack of eat less or avoid messages. I, for example, am expected to consume four cups of fruits and vegetables, six ounces of grains, five ounces of meat, and, of course, three cups of milk a day, along with a couple of hundred discretionary calories that I can spend on junk foods. For all its flaws, the 1992 pyramid was easier to understand and use. One clue to this disaster comes from Porter Novelli, the public relations firm hired by the USDA to develop the 1992 pyramid as well as this one. The firm presented a preliminary design to the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in January 2004. That design looked much like the final version, with one critical exception. It illustrated hierarchy in food choice. For example, the grain band displayed whole grain bread at the bottom, pasta about halfway up, and cinnamon buns at the top. The USDA eliminated all traces of hierarchy in the final version, presumably because it does not want to advise eating less of any food, useful as such advice might be to an overweight public. The Anti-Obesity Movement In seeking to reverse rising rates of overweight, especially among children, Health advocates, as well as lawyers, legislators, and investment bankers, have singled out food industry marketing as a significant influence on food choice. They have put food companies on notice that selling junk foods to children is no longer acceptable. Food companies, they say, must improve their products and marketing practices or face losses of sales, legal challenges, and regulatory restrictions. Food politics was not alone in predicting this reaction. By 2003, three British investment banking firms had warned food industry clients that obesity posed a threat to company profits. UBS Warburg, for example, warned food companies to stop hiding behind personal responsibility. With sales of organics and healthier foods growing rapidly, the issue for food and drink companies is whether they can adapt to these changes or even lead them, or will they be left behind promoting anachronistic processed foods and sugary drinks while their target customer has moved on. Investment banks advised companies to produce healthier foods and market them more responsibly or face lawsuits and regulations. Restricting Food Marketing to Children Investment analysts view marketing to children as the industry's Achilles heel. As Food Politics explains, the personal responsibility argument does not apply to children too young to distinguish sales pitches from information. Marketing junk food to young people crosses ethical boundaries and makes companies vulnerable to advocacy challenges. Research Advocacy Since 2002, academic researchers national government agencies, and international health agencies have thoroughly documented the effects of food marketing on children's food attitudes and behavior. In the United States, the Institute of Medicine, IOM, summarized this research in three reports published between 2004 and 2006. The second of these reports focused on food marketing. It makes chilling reading. 
The IOM reviewed 123 peer-reviewed studies examining how food marketing affects children's food preferences and requests, eating habits, and body weight. The cautious conclusion. The idea that food marketing increases the risk of obesity cannot be rejected. Attribute the caution to politics. In preparing this report, the IOM operated under a handicap. Because Congress requires government-sponsored committees to make public all documents used in deliberations, food companies refuse to reveal proprietary information about their marketing practices. Even so, the report describes the extent of the research enterprise devoted to selling foods to children, the methods food companies use to identify the psychological underpinnings of children's food choices, the ways these methods affect children's requests for brands, and the effects of such choices on health. Selling food to children is big business, and much effort goes into it. One key observation of this and other reports is the shift in marketing methods from those that are visible to parents to those that are not. Television remains the dominant method for reaching children, but the balance is shifting to product placement in toys, games, educational materials, songs, and movies, cartoon licensing and celebrity endorsements, and stealth methods such as advert games and viral campaigns involving word of mouth, cellular telephone text messages, and the Internet. Methods largely invisible to today's busy and sometimes electronically challenged parents. Legislative and Litigation Approaches The IOM Food Marketing Report warned companies to voluntarily regulate themselves or Congress should enact legislation mandating the shift. It summarized the policies of at least 50 other countries that regulate television advertising aimed at children based largely on a 2004 WHO report. In the United States, decades of attempts to regulate marketing to children have been blocked by industry invocations of self-regulation and of First Amendment protections of commercial speech. These attempts began in 1970, when Action for Children's Television, already concerned about the effects of commercials on children's food choices, petitioned the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, to ban advertising during children's programming. The FCC observed that children's television depends on advertising and denied the petition. In 1978, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, proposed banning television advertising to children under age 8 and restricting advertising of sugary foods to children of any age. This proposal elicited so much protest that Congress fired the FTC chairman and passed the FTC Improvement Act of 1980 to permanently block the agency's authority to regulate advertising to children. Ten years later, Congress passed the Children's Television Act, which restricted commercials during children's weekday programs to 12 minutes per hour and during weekends to 10.5 minutes per hour. These generous limits are still in effect. The alleged rationale for congressional reluctance to regulate the marketing of junk foods to children is First Amendment protection of free speech. For decades, the Supreme Court has interpreted this protection as applying to commercial speech, advertising and marketing, as much as to political, artistic, and religious speech. Thus, the IOM's or else demand that Congress regulate food marketing must be viewed as a call for reinterpreting First Amendment protections to allow present policies to change. Senator Tom Harkin, Democrat Iowa, has introduced bills to restore the FTC's authority to regulate marketing directed at children, but these have not yet been taken seriously. The level of resistance to be expected to such calls is evident from remarks made by the head of the FTC at a 2005 workshop on obesity and advertising. I want to be clear that from the FTC's perspective, this workshop is not the first step toward new government regulations to ban or restrict children's food advertising and marketing. The FTC tried that approach in the 1970s, and it failed for good reasons. 
Frustrated by legislative inaction, CSPI, the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, and two sets of parents threatened to sue Viacom, the owner of Nickelodeon, the children's TV channel, and Kellogg, on the grounds that using the SpongeBob SquarePants character to promote junk food is harmful to children's health. Although the threat had not been acted on by the end of 2006, further actions like this could be forthcoming. Lawyers and legal advocacy groups are exploring ways to use legal strategies to address childhood obesity. The Public Health Law Program of California's Public Health Institute, for example, produces a color-coded guide to regulatory opportunities at the local, state, or federal level. This group classifies legal efforts to restrict the sale of non-nutritious foods and beverages to children as green, likely to withstand legal challenges if carefully crafted, meaning well worth consideration. It considers actions like regulating food advertising to children as yellow, more vulnerable to a legal challenge than green even if carefully crafted. Restricting advertising on electronic media, however, is red, unlikely to withstand a legal challenge. This, however, could change. Regulating School Food For all of the reasons why food marketers are in schools in the first place, a large, captive, impressionable audience with influence, schools are prime targets for obesity intervention. Parents, teachers, and food service directors in schools across the country have transformed meal programs to deliver healthier food along with a curriculum that teaches children about where food comes from and how it is produced. Effective and important as these grassroots efforts may be, they must be instituted school by school and depend on individuals rather than policy. This makes statewide approaches seem attractive, and many states have introduced legislation to address food issues in schools. Many of these bills focus on vending machines, key targets because they are now in so many schools. More than 90% of high schools and nearly half of all elementary schools in 2005. Yet one analysis of the economics of soft drink contracts the arrangements that put vending machines into schools in the first place, found that they generate an average of only $18 per student per year, an amount that ought to be obtainable by other means, and that hardly seems worth the price in children's health. Groups that track school obesity legislation counted more than 30 states in 2005 that considered or enacted laws related to nutrition standards, nutrition education, reporting of body weights, or physical activity, and about the same number in 2006. Intense lobbying by industry prevents passage of most of these bills or dilutes their impact. Overall, a 2006 evaluation by CSPI of state standards for competitive foods, for example, yielded not one grade of A. Kentucky rated an A-. CSPI gave C's and D's to 15 states but completely failed 23 others. State oversight of food standards, says CSPI, is fragmented, incremental, and not happening quickly enough. Its succinct conclusion, the sale of junk food and sugary drinks in schools is a national problem that needs a national solution. Many would agree, but the national response has been slow. In 2004, as part of reauthorization of the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, Congress required local school districts to establish wellness programs by 2006, but provided only minimal funding for this purpose. Although the requirement gives schools a mandate to improve the food environment, Doing so remains local and voluntary. In May 2006, both houses of Congress introduced bills to tighten restrictions on when and where competitive foods can be sold in schools and to broaden the definition of minimal nutritional value to include a greater range of foods. Given enough public demand, such bills might eventually pass. Because of industry pressures, 
Few state legislatures have attempted to restrict food marketing in schools. Legal advocates, however, point out that schools have the right to control what happens on their property. The California Public Health Institute's law program, for example, also publishes a guide to regulating junk food in public schools. It gives a green light to bans on marketing junk food on school property, but is pessimistically red about restricting teachers from using educational materials produced by food companies for classroom instruction. Labeling Calories in Fast Food and Other Restaurants An obvious way to inform people about the link between calories and obesity is to prominently display the calorie content of foods of different portion sizes on package labels and in restaurants. In 2003, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, established a work group on obesity to advise the agency about its role in obesity prevention. The work group's 2004 report advised the FDA to solicit public comment on how to give greater prominence to calories on food labels and to encourage food manufacturers to label packages as single servings if the foods might reasonably be expected to be consumed by one person at one sitting. This proposal would mean that a 20-ounce soda labeled as 110 calories per serving and 2.5 servings per bottle would instead be labeled as 275 calories. Later that year, CSPI petitioned the FDA to require such labeling. The FDA requested public comment on the proposal in April 2005, but had not acted on it through mid-2007. In 2006, Nine states and the District of Columbia introduced bills requiring such labeling, as did Senator Tom Harkin at the federal level. None passed. In December 2006, however, the New York City Board of Health ruled that fast food restaurants and places like Starbucks, which sell uniformly sized foods and already provide nutrition information, must post calories on menus and menu boards. The board also barred restaurants from using trans fats. These precedent-setting actions were possible because New York City has exceptionally high rates of obesity and heart disease, and its health commissioner and mayor wanted to do something about them. Given the policy gap at the state and federal levels, other city health departments may take similar actions. Calorie labeling could help. Food consumed outside the home is typically larger in serving size and higher in calories than that prepared at home, and people consume more calories from larger portions. Research on the effects of providing calorie information suggests that it promotes more healthful choices. Thus, the Board of Health approved the rule and gave the 10% of New York restaurants affected by it until July 2007 to comply. The board's actions disappointed the New York State Restaurant Association, which threatened legal action. The Restaurant Association said it had worked with a coalition of national chain restaurant companies and the National Restaurant Association to defeat both proposals. Unfortunately, since the Board of Health is not a legislative body, it is very difficult to lobby. Despite the fact that the industry collectively submitted hundreds of pages of testimony in opposition to the proposals and had at least four different meetings with the commissioner, the board failed to make any significant changes to the two proposals. Our group has also been working with political analysts and a legal team to explore all possible options and next steps. The Anti-Trans Fat Movement Trans fats are an easy target for advocacy. They are artificially produced through partial hydrogenation of vegetable oils and are unnatural. Evidence suggests that they raise the risk of heart disease as much as and perhaps even more than saturated fats. They affect obesity only indirectly. Healthier fats have as many calories. But because removing them from the food supply is feasible, Getting rid of trans fats has become a focal point of advocacy for changes in the food environment. Although trans fats have been understood to be harmful since the 1970s, serious attempts to ban them began only in 1994, 
When CSPI petitioned the FDA to require disclosure of trans fat content on nutrition facts labels, the FDA agreed to do so in 2003 but gave food companies until January 2006 to comply. The 12 year delay is explained by objections from food manufacturers. Partially hydrogenated oils are cheap, not least because soybean production is subsidized. Also, substitutes are less stable, have a shorter shelf life, and cannot be as easily manipulated to achieve a desired thickness. But listing a harmful substance on food labels might reduce sales and make companies vulnerable to lawsuits. Indeed, Stephen Joseph, founder of BanTransFats.com, sued Kraft Foods in May 2003 to prevent deceptive marketing to children of Oreo cookies made with trans fats. Kraft quickly eliminated partially hydrogenated oils from Oreo formulas. By the time the FDA labeling requirement went into effect in January 2006, food manufacturers had managed to find acceptable substitutes. By then, it was already difficult to find a nutrition facts label listing anything other than zero grams trans fats. Restaurants and bakeries, however, were not affected by FDA labeling rules and continued to use partially hydrogenated oils. In 2002, McDonald's announced that it would convert its frying oils to those free of trans fats by early 2003. When the company failed to act on that promise, Joseph filed another lawsuit. As part of the settlement of that suit, McDonald's continued to use the same oils, but was required to reveal the trans fat content of its products in nutrition information brochures. Example, large fries contained 8 grams trans fat in December 2006. In 2004, Denmark restricted oils containing trans fats to a maximum of 2% of the fat in any product. Studies found that consumers did not notice any alteration in taste. In 2006, CSPI threatened to file a class action lawsuit demanding that Kentucky Fried Chicken stop using partially hydrogenated oils or notify customers that its products contained trans fat. Tiburon, a small town on San Francisco Bay, became the first U.S. city to ask for a voluntary ban on the use of trans fats in 2004. Late in 2006, the New York City Board of Health voted to restrict service of unhealthful artificial trans fats in all of the city's food service establishments. By the end of 2006, it seemed likely that the anti-trans fat movement would eventually succeed in getting rid of these fats. The extent to which this accomplishment would improve heart disease rates, however, remained to be determined. Responses of the Food Industry Obesity poses difficult challenges for food companies, caught as they are between the demands of advocates and those of stockholders. In Appetite for Profit, Nation Books 2006, Michelle Simon explains how pressures from advocates, regulators, lawyers, and Wall Street put food companies in an impossible dilemma. If they stop marketing junk food to children, they lose sales. Food companies first dealt with this dilemma by denying responsibility for contributing to an eat-more food environment. Later, while they continued lobbying, attacking critics, and promoting physical activity, as food politics describes, they also adopted additional strategies. They pressed states to pass laws protecting them from legal liability. At the same time, they reformulated products to make them appear better for you, identified the healthier versions through self-endorsements, and pushed for use of a greater range of health and structure function claims to market those products. To address concerns about marketing, they invoked voluntary self-regulation as the primary strategy. Lobby for Protection Against Obesity Liability In 2002, McDonald's was sued on behalf of two teenagers who claimed they had become overweight and chronically ill as a result of eating its products. Although the suit might appear frivolous, the courts took it seriously and were still dealing with it five years later. 
Food companies responded to this threat by pressing state legislatures to pass common sense consumption laws to exempt them from civil liability for obesity and its health consequences. By 2006, 23 states had passed such legislation. The House proposed a federal act in 2005 that would force dismissal of all anti-obesity court cases new and pending, but the bill failed to pass in 2006. States remain the focus of such attempts. In 2005, 26 states considered such legislation, and another 16 did so in 2006. Make Better For You Products Virtually all major food companies tweaked the contents of existing products or created new products to make them appear more healthful. PepsiCo advertised snack foods with zero grams trans fat. General Mills added whole grains to all of its cereals, thereby creating whole grain count chocula and increasing the fiber content from zero to one gram per serving. The company also replaced some of the sugars in Cocoa Puffs with the artificial sweetener Splenda, but these products failed to sell and were withdrawn at the end of 2006. Post Craft improved Fruity Pebbles by reducing sugars from 12 to 9 grams per serving and adding 3 grams of polydextrose fiber. Although the labels on these products are easily interpreted as advertising them as health foods, the companies make no such claim. Instead, they offer the products as better-for-you options. This strategy assumes that making small improvements will make the products healthier, as well as improving the health of the children and adults who consume them. It remains uncertain whether artificial sweeteners and polydextrose are better for children, or whether such products produce measurable health benefits. Self-endorse health benefits. Most major food companies have established their own criteria for nutritional evaluation of their own products. PepsiCo identifies its self-determined better-for-you products with green smart spots. General Mills cereals sport goodness corners. Kellogg cereals have flags. And Kraft's healthier products are sensible solutions. The company's criteria allow many products high in sugars, fat, and calories to qualify. In 2006, Hannaford, a supermarket chain in the Northeast, recruited a group of independent nutrition scientists to develop a guiding stars program to award one, two, or three stars to food products based on independently determined nutritional standards. By these independent criteria, less than 25% of the store's 27,000 products and virtually none of the food company's self-endorsed products qualified for even one star. By independent criteria, junk foods are not health foods. Use health claims to market products. The FDA has continued to approve health claims that meet standards for significant scientific agreement. In 2006, it accepted a petition from the Barley Foods Council that barley fiber can help prevent coronary heart disease and passively permitted claims that diets low in saturated fat and cholesterol and as low as possible in trans fat may reduce the risk of heart disease, Kraft Foods, and that Drinking fluoridated water may reduce the risk of tooth decay. Covington and Burling, a law firm acting on behalf of an unidentified client. Health claims sell foods, and food companies care little about scientific substantiation. When the FDA denied claims on the basis of lack of substantiation, companies sued, and usually won. The FDA was forced to acknowledge that consumers benefit from more information on food labels concerning diet and health. Moreover, past court decisions have clarified the need to provide for health claims based on less science evidence rather than just on the standard of significant scientific agreement, SSA, as long as the claims do not mislead the consumers. 
clarified the need in this case means that the courts told the FDA it could not require companies to base health claims on science. Although FDA research demonstrates that consumers tend to interpret health claims as backed by science, the court decisions convinced it to begin allowing qualified health claims, those lacking in significant substantiation, and the FDA began considering such claims in 2003. By the end of 2006, the FDA had placed a dozen or more qualified claims under enforcement discretion, meaning that companies can use them as written. Why a company would want to is another matter, as illustrated by two examples from 2005. Two studies do not show that drinking green tea reduces the risk of breast cancer in women, but one weaker, more limited study suggests that drinking green tea may reduce this risk. Based on these studies, FDA concludes that it is highly unlikely that green tea reduces the risk of breast cancer. Very limited and preliminary scientific research suggests that eating one half to one cup of tomatoes and or tomato sauce a week may reduce the risk of prostate cancer. FDA concludes that there is little scientific evidence supporting this claim. These are approved claims. It may be difficult to imagine what it takes to get a claim denied, but the FDA has denied many. Among them, that omega-3 eggs reduce the risk for coronary heart disease, requested by Belovo, a maker of functional eggs, and that hydrolyzed whey protein in infant formulas reduces the risk of infant food allergies. Nestle The result of the current free-for-all in health claim regulation is most evident in supermarket cereal aisles. In 2006, you could buy Kellogg's Smart Start, labeled as Healthy Heart, with oat bran, potassium, and low sodium, and as containing ingredients that can help lower both blood pressure and cholesterol, despite an ingredient list that includes sugars in 11 places. post craft Honey Nut Shredded Wheat was labeled Lose 10 Pounds, The Heart Healthy Way, Cereals from several makers say their products help support a healthy immune system, a structure function claim just like the ones allowed for dietary supplements. Promote Voluntary Self-Regulation In July 2003, Kraft Foods became the first U.S. food company to appear to accept responsibility for childhood obesity when it announced new anti-obesity initiatives in an exclusive front-page story in USA Today. The company promised to set standards for marketing practices and to eliminate all in-school marketing. Two years later, Kraft rolled out its Sensible Solutions program and said that it would advertise only these healthier products to children ages 6 to 11. This meant that Kraft would not advertise regular Kool-Aid beverages, Oreo cookies, some post cereals, and most Lunchables to children under age 12. These promises angered officials of other food companies, who thought Kraft's voluntary efforts could be viewed as an admission of guilt and encourage regulation. At the same time, Kraft also said it would continue to display cartoon characters on product labels, and did not intend to reduce its $80 million annual expenditure on advertising to children. And it joined General Mills, Kellogg, and other companies in an Alliance for American Advertising aimed at protecting the industry's First Amendment right to market to children and to self-regulate. By self-regulation, the industry mainly means the Children's Advertising Review Unit, CARU which has issued voluminous guidelines about advertising to children since the 1970s. The guidelines for foods say, among other things, that commercials should encourage good nutritional practices, depict products within the framework of a balanced diet, and show snacks as snacks, not meals. The guidelines sound reasonable, but nobody outside of the industry believes that they are either followed or enforced 
which is only to be expected from an entity funded by the companies it supposedly regulates. The guidelines are voluntary, and critics cite numerous examples of advertisements to children that violate one or another of the CARU precepts. CARU expects much cooperation from the FTC, not least because of the revolving door. CARU's parent body, the National Advertising Review Council, is now headed by a former FTC official. In August 2006, Tim Lang and his colleagues at City University London published an evaluation of statements made by the world's 25 largest food companies about diet, physical activity, and obesity prevention. Their report examined the company's published positions on 28 questions such as, Is there a commitment on sugar? Is there a commitment on portion size? Is there a policy specifically focused on children and food marketing? Because they found few companies making such commitments, they concluded that this industry is not yet fully engaged with the seriousness and urgency of the challenge of childhood obesity. I supervised related case studies of McDonald's and Kraft that supported this conclusion. Self-regulation seems the answer to perceptions of industry inaction, and 2006 was a big year for attention to this method. In April, the FTC and DHHS issued a report on food industry self-regulation. Although the report favorably viewed recent marketing innovations, such as 100-calorie snack packs and packages of baby carrots illustrated with SpongeBob square pants, the agencies urged CARU to take more forceful actions, among them to develop nutrition standards for foods marketed to children. The agencies also said they would monitor whether CARU put such changes into effect. In May, former President Bill Clinton's foundation and the American Heart Association helped the American Beverage Association preempt class action suits by announcing an agreement to phase out sweetened beverages sold in schools. Coca-Cola, Cadbury Schweppes, and Pepsi celebrated this agreement in full-page advertisements in national newspapers. Nutrition isn't what's on their minds, but we know it's on yours. It's all part of a broader effort to teach children the importance of a balanced diet and exercise. In October, the Clinton Foundation brokered an agreement with five leading food manufacturers to set nutritional standards for snacks sold in schools. In November, ten of the world's largest food companies, which together account for more than two-thirds of television advertising to children, announced formation of a new children's food and beverage advertising initiative to limit the marketing of junk food. Among other pledges, the initiative called for half of television advertising to promote healthier foods or lifestyles, for cessation of advertising in elementary schools, and for reduction of use of licensed cartoon characters in advertising for foods that do not meet nutritional criteria. Advocates dismissed the initiative as voluntary, unenforceable, and full of loopholes, but it was also criticized by the trade publication Advertising Age as not much of a concession, spin, and based on fears of the ever-lurking threat of litigation or legislation. The initiative has also forced big food into essentially demonizing itself, weakening its long-held stance that all foods are okay in moderation. In December, the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, said self-regulation wasn't working and called for federal regulation of food marketing to children. The First Amendment allows advertisements to be restricted or even banned if there is a significant public health risk. Cigarette advertising and alcohol advertising would seem to fall squarely into this category, and ads for junk food could easily be restricted. The AAP told pediatricians to counsel patients to limit children to no more than two hours a day of television and to lobby for outright bans on advertising junk foods in schools and on children's television, as well as for a 50% decrease in the time allowed for commercials during those programs. 
This time, Advertising Age told the industry to fight back. It gave some good advice. Food marketers should stop making spurious claims for health benefits. Functional drinks are practically begging for regulation. But then it warned food companies to stop hiding behind self-regulation and put responsibility for children's diets squarely where it belongs, on parents. Looking Forward By the end of 2006, the lines were drawn. Advocates as well as investment analysts, lawyers, and legislators had placed food companies on notice that they would have to change business practices in response to childhood obesity or face dire consequences. In the United States, advertising age ranked campaigns against industry self-regulation and marketing to children as among the top legal issues for 2007. Great Britain announced a traffic light rating system for food products and a ban that would begin in 2007. British regulators described lobbying efforts against these measures as the most ferocious we've ever experienced. The ferocity, along with alliances to defend the right to market to children and to keep lobbying free of liability, are largely invisible to the public. What the public sees is the public relations, the tinkering with product formulas and the promises about marketing practices. The healthier versions may be better choices, but they are not necessarily good choices. Children would be much better off eating fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, not better-for-you, highly processed junk foods. Food companies cannot resolve the impossible dilemma on their own. For business reasons, they cannot and will not stop making nutritionally questionable food products and marketing them to children. Regulations are needed, and they will surely come. Thus, the ferocity must also be seen as a tribute to the effectiveness of the current food movement. At the moment, this movement provides much cause for optimism. May it flourish. This is Kate Redding for University Press Audiobooks. Thank you for listening. This abridged audiobook is copyrighted in 2010 in the name of Redwood Audiobooks and is based on the book Food Politics by Marian Nessel published by University of California Press and copyrighted in 2002 by Marian Nessel. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.